Hello. My name is Eileen Kennedy, and I am professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. Uh, my co-moderator is Jamie Morrison, who is director of the Food Systems and Food Safety Division at FAO. Before I uh, go any further, I do want to say this webinar is being recorded. So we welcome you to the FAO Tufts webinar on true cost accounting of food, uh, con conducted in conjunction with uh, Feed the Futures Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab, as well as the Friedman School's Food Systems Initiative. And as I was thinking about this uh, webinar, it occurred to me that many of us who are participating today, both as speakers and as, as participants, were involved in various ways in the United Nations Food Systems Summit. I mean, one of the things, for example, was in July of 2021, uh, FAO hosted a pre-summit um, in which, of course, Maximo and uh, Jamie uh, were actively involved. Uh, many of us at the Friedman School were collaborating on various uh, ramp up activities to the summit, such as participating in the action tracks. And as I look at the that full complement of activities, what was very clear in those discussions, and one message very clear, although the September 2021 UN Food Systems Summit was an extraordinary event, it is the follow up on recommendations and commitments uh, made at the summit that will be critical for effectively transforming food systems for sustainable, healthy diets. And obviously, this is a big conversation in today's webinar. Tufts University made um, some specific commitments to the summit to involve in relevant research, communications, and advocacy to improve food systems globally. And to that end, today's webinar is just one of various activities, one example that reflects Tufts' commitment to follow up. So the webinar today will involve two sessions, each with a keynote speaker and two discussants. And then we do ask participants, please post your questions on the Q&A site. So now without further ado, I am really pleased to introduce uh, Maximo Torero, who's the chief economist at FAO, and Darius Mozafarian, who is the dean of the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy at Tufts University. I'll hand it over to you, Maximo. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and very happy to be here. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to, to open this big event behalf, on behalf of FAO. And we are very pleased to be partnering with Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition we have several partnerships with you and, and especially in addressing this approach that could be game changing in our attempts to support the transformation to more sustainable agri-food systems. No, we are living chocks every, every six months um, and the latest one, the war in Ukraine, uh, which is disturbing everything we do, but we cannot lose track of important issues that needs to be brought into the discussion. So in that sense, uh, this workshop is extremely welcome so that we can continue looking at central issues. In the process uh, towards the UN Food Systems Summit last year, as you mentioned, uh, the importance of changes in food price mechanisms that reflect the true cost of food production and consumption was strongly argued for. It was argued at different levels in the scientific committee, in, in the different coalitions, uh, and in many discussions that were held in the summit. While there is no unified or a standard method of accounting uh, for the real price of food, the true cost accounting framework is gaining prominence that it encompasses the measurement and the evaluation of externalities across the environment, social, economic, and health domains. One of the bigger efforts we did at FAO was to develop the modeling framework to be able to capture the trade-offs, which is a, a part of these externalities, trying to capture the externalities over the environment, over the nature uh, and biodiversity, that could be created because of our actions to achieve um, access to healthy diets for all. And that was really important because it gave an, an idea of what were the consequences of our potential actions as a result of the transformation pathways of, of the countries. But as, as we will see in the first session today, this requires a lot of information and many assumptions. 
To calculate the cost of food across the environment domain means estimating the underlying cost related to greenhouse gas emissions, soils loss, water use, biodiversity loss, soil, water, and air pollution. And if we want to go even further, we should be talking about of opportunity costs, not only accounting costs. And that is really important. And within the social domain, costs related to wage inequality, to inequalities in consumer access to nutritious food, and to occupational hazards needs to be calculated. There has been enormous research on calculating the cost of life. So imagine trying to disentangle the cost of inequalities in consumers' access. So it's extremely complex. It's a second moment that we want to measure what it will be the effect over that second moment of the distribution, which is not easy to do. The other economic costs often unaccounted in the, in the price of food are the direct and market-related support measures that producers and consumers receive and costs related to the food loss and waste. And the health dimension, which includes the direct medical cost of loss of labor productivity, but also of under or over nutrition, which also have consequences, especially over nutrition in non-communicable diseases. While we are some way from understanding the true cost of food, it is clear that tracking the issue of the destructive underpricing of food is important and that the total and, and, that, and calculating the true cost uh, of agriculture can play a role in promoting across agri-food systems by governments, investors, and producers and consumers. And it's important to understand that not necessarily uh, this means that prices will go up. It means that we need to understand what is behind those commodities that are moving across borders and how we need to capture those and value those externalities so that governments and other players can put the proper incentives in place. The second session today will consider how TCA can help governments to rethink policy support mechanisms to create fair and appropriate rules and regulations and to provide greater transparency so that consumers are more aware of their choices. Governments have an opportunity to at least partially correct for negative externalities related to food production and consumption through various direct and indirect market support measures. The measures should, however, be designed in the context of various intra-regional and global agreements, which together determine the policy space within which governments can enact price policy. This reminds us that with natural, while national priorities for food system transformation remain paramount, national decisions impact global markets and in turn global market evolutions impact the scope of national decisions makers, both in the short and in the long run. So the interconnectedness is there. The current global market context brings into sharp focus the importance of taking into account government scope for implementing measures aim at internalizing the externalities associated with the food production. Today, both food prices and input prices, notably energy and fertilizer, are at historical high levels. Not only that, we have a new way of linking energy to food, which is through the fertilizers, because they use energy to be able to be produced. And when there is a scarce energy and prices are so high, it's easy to substitute the production of fertilizers for other types of consumption. And that has a significant cost and potential cost on the future harvest of agriculture today. So adopting a true cost approach in the context of high prices could be argued to put problem problematic, given the further pressure on already vulnerable producers and consumers, particularly when those price increases are associated with broader cost of living increases. However, it is also provides an opportunity to reorient the current agri-food systems away from high reliance on inputs and high natural resource used towards the less intensive systems. And one of the things that FAO is recommending uh, under the current crisis, for example, is to increase, increase efficiencies. Efficiencies in the input use, because we know that most of the fertilizers being used not necessarily are responding to the needs of the soils and especially to the demand of the plants. So it's not only to give fertilizers NPK to the soils, but also to respond to what the plants need. So it depends on the crop that you are planting, how much you should put into the soils. And similarly, while account needs to be taken of the significant number of consumers who are already constrained in their access to healthy diets as a result of limits on their affordability, true cost accounting has the potential to steer consumers away from foods that are produced in unsustainable systems. Clearly, there are trade-offs to be made in developing pathways towards more sustainable agri-food systems. And I am sure that we will hear many perspectives on this issue during the webinar today. So thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure for me to see that we are moving ahead in such an important topic. Thank you. I'm back to you. Thank you so much uh, for those 
opening comments. Uh, my name is Dariush Mozafarian. I'm the, the Dean of the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, and I'm really delighted to be here at, at, and welcome everyone to this event. The Friedman School is very happy to be co-hosting this event with the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, one of the most important global organizations addressing the challenges and opportunities in food. Malnutrition in all its forms, including undernutrition and diet-related chronic diseases, is the top cause of death and disability in the world. And yet, compared to the attention devoted to other global threats, nutrition security really has not been given the prioritization or the investments that it deserves. The food system influences nearly all of the sustainable development goals. And to achieve those goals, we have to create a food system that nourishes people and the planet. The Friedman School has been actively involved in education and scholarship and translation around these issues for many, many years. At the recent UN Food System Summit, as uh, has been mentioned, for example, uh, Drs. Eileen Kennedy, Patrick Webb, Will Masters, and others uh, were active participants in action tracks, as well as supportive scientific groups, including one on true cost accounting for food. After the summit, our activities uh, will together as a global community will be as important, if not more important than the summit itself. The summit is really the start of the race, not the finish line. The Friedman School continues to be involved in research, communication and advocacy to advance practical science-based recommendations to address hunger, reduce diet-related chronic diseases and improve sustainability in the global food system. Today's webinar is just one example of our continued involvement and partnership in these post-summit activities. It's essential to use true cost accounting as one method to understand the true cost and value of food. This was highlighted in the Food System Summit as well as other work. There are many direct externalities and consequences of modern food systems that are not historically captured in the way we think about food. And this true cost accounting approach can identify what we might think of as the hidden costs of the food system on health, on equity, on workers, on the environment. In the United States, for example, a true cost uh, accounting analysis was recently done by the Rockefeller Foundation. You'll probably hear about this from Roy Steiner. And that estimated that for every $1 directly spent on food, the US economy loses $2, largely due to lost health and environmental costs. That is not a winning proposition to be spending a dollar on food and having $2 of negative economic consequences. This type of use of true cost accounting has enormous potential to identify and highlight economic consequences for decision makers, both in government and in the private sector, to facilitate a transition to healthy, sustainable, and economically vibrant food systems. I welcome everyone to this important event, and I look forward to a series of terrific presentations and lively discussions. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, back to you. Thank you, Mopsmo and uh, Dari. Uh, sets a great tone for the, the rest of the uh, webinar. I'd now like to move into session one, which is the true cost accounting of food. Uh, the keynote speaker is Will Masters, who is professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, Tufts University. And uh, I'll say this because he's very humble. Uh, his research has been at the forefront uh, of work on calculating uh, the cost of a healthy, sustainable diet. Uh, we have two uh, distinguished discussants after Will's presentation, Roy Steiner. Dari has already mentioned the seminal report released um, last summer uh, by Rockefeller Foundation on the true cost of food, and Roy was uh, intimately involved in that. Uh, the second discussion is uh, discussant is Cheryl Hendricks, who uh, is professor, and I'll have to read this one, chair of the Department of Natural and Natural and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Pretoria. Uh, equally important, she was the lead author of the scientific new paper on true cost and true value of food, which was a, again, a key input into the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And with that, Will, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Eileen, uh, and to everybody for joining. Um, it's just such a treat to have this group together. So I hope folks appreciate what an all-star cast this is. Only Eileen Kennedy could bring this group together with Jamie Morrison, bringing um, such a distinguished set of people from Europe and the United States to have this conversation. I see from the participant list, like lots of familiar colleagues, collaborators um, in Africa and even a couple in Asia, 
um, despite the time zone. So really appreciate everyone coming together for this. Um, I'll share the screen in order to walk through what we've learned from this deep dive into food prices, the project that we call Food Prices for Nutrition, thinking about all the major food groups needed for a healthy diet and how we can measure them in uh, and, and move towards this goal of true cost accounting that Maximo so clearly laid out at the start. So the main point really just in, in one slide, just to give the overview of the whole thing is that we can measure cost and affordability in dramatically new ways. And the reason is that we have through collaboration between Tufts and FAO around the SOFI report, the state of food security and nutrition in the world with the 2020 report for the first time, taking these standardized data and methods that bring across interests across all UN agencies and across the nutrition community linked to agriculture uh, and health to think about retail prices for not dozens of uh, agricultural commodities, farm commodities, but thousands and thousands of differentiated items, different in each location in terms of their composition, their formulation, uh, as well as their price. And we're drawing together just an enormous range of, of, of data sources on these retail prices, and then bringing them to the literature on diet quality, on essential nutrients, and also on dietary guidelines that specify in terms of food categories, uh, the necessities for an overall healthy, healthy life. So defining food security in nutritional terms uh, by matching items to the composition of their uh, ingredients um, and selecting least cost items to think about affordability in a way that respects the autonomy of people to choose a culturally appropriate diet from the available items uh, and think about if you were very low income, what could you afford to buy? And that allows us to see whether agriculture and food supply is in fact able to meet people's needs at affordable prices. So what do we find? Real costs are surprisingly uniform around the world. Low income people do not get a discount. There is no poor person's discount in the world for food. You have to bid against rich people for the food that you buy. For the 3 billion who cannot afford this overall healthy diet, it is a supply and safety net issue. Unless agriculture and food systems dramatically lower the real cost and the true cost as discussed uh, in a moment, um, we would need just to, to ramp up the kinds of safety nets that were pioneered in the United States in the 1960s, what we now call SNAP and WIC, uh, that are deployed around the world by the WFP and many other agencies. There's really a social protection revolution going on now um, in response to COVID and in response to the perceived understand the understanding that these foods are simply not affordable to meet dietary guidelines for so many people uh, in, around the world. For the remaining, what we discover, that's a, you know, most of the world's population, um, what we find is that people could buy healthy items. It is physically possible, it is economically possible, and these items are culturally appropriate. Uh, the, pro the issues are, right, people don't buy them, they don't buy them because they're displaced by other foods, and they're displaced by other foods because it's very costly to get into meal preparation and so forth that we'll talk about very briefly. Um, and this true cost agenda adds to this new revolution in, in food price analysis, which uh, allows us to think uh, beyond just the market to external costs. These things that are unseen, unmeasured, the runoff, the emissions uh, and climate change consequences, the antibiotic resistance, and so many thing, other things that are unseen, unmeasured, until they're estimated with some kind of analytical model. We've made enormous progress in doing that and in getting some data on these non-market, um, otherwise unmeasured costs. The focus has been on environmental cost. And so the pioneering work that I hope Roy will talk about from the Rockefeller Foundation and others, putting a real spotlight on this distinctive, much, much higher uh, carbon and methane emissions from uh, the beef sector. Um, what we find in our work is that when we think about the least cost, most affordable diets, we find they actually have very low external costs. So they have low true costs. Um, and But when we think about these true costs of these healthy foods, we need to count in all these enormous benefits because these do in fact add years of healthy life. They do in fact reduce costs uh, of health care, And these are positive externalities from the food system when the food system is delivering healthy uh, as well as affordable items. So there's a big opportunity here to match our market data with non-market data and, uh, and move forward as we'll discuss. So what's the reason for all this? Because governments pursue what they measure. The sustainable development goals have been, you know, not just a lapel pin, 
and a background from Maximo and others, the sustainable development goals have been goalposts, have been targets, and governments pursue what they measure. What we've had for, for, for decades, really centuries even, is caloric adequacy as a goal, and then a whole set of diverse other targets, food security, diet diversity, defined in a variety of ways. So what we've done is to define it in these two steps. So nutrient adequacy in terms of the least cost items to avoid deficiencies and avoid excesses of essential nutrients. And then this next step of healthy diets, which is the focus of Sophie and, and many other uh, potential targets for governments around the world. So this is a very, very big literature uh, emerging on least cost diets to meet diet quality, what you see is contributions on a variety of themes about this kind of, kind of work. Um, the goal is to distinguish unaffordability, that is a, a failure of supply, from other barriers to healthy eating. So our goal is to distinguish the, our, our primary funding here is from the uh, agricultural team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and also in the FCDO from UK aid. Uh, and it's really focused on just understanding agriculture and supply and whether food systems are failing to supply. And we want to distinguish that failure of supply from other barriers to healthy eating. The goal to guide intervention, lower costs if possible, but safety nets for those who cannot afford once costs are brought as low as possible. Um, and that leads to these other interventions that would be needed. So there's lots and lots of issues going on. Our goal is just to focus on this one question of is supply failing to meet this health need? Clearly, this is not just a national issue. It's not just guiding national governments. FAO provides worldwide leadership on this. And our focus has really been on getting the word out as it were through uh, this collaboration with uh, Maximo and the uh, SOFI team across all of the agencies involved, You know, not just FAO and not just the Rome-based agencies, uh, but also uh, WHO and UNICEF. So our collaboration at Tufts is not just with, with FAO, but also uh, closely integrated with the World Bank, which does this price monitoring. Um, and so we will have a World Bank data hub with detailed uh, uh, data on these uh, to be launched uh, soon after the SOFI 2022. The data are integrated into actionable targets. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that announcements can clearly focus on. It's something that's measurable. It's something that's uh, reportable. You can add it up, you can disaggregate it, and you can think about how it influences uh, potential targets. And we see that having come out of the dialogue in the Food System Summit. So clearly, uh, what we're trying to do is distinguish between all the different foods. You know, Behind every set of fruits and vegetables, there's a whole bunch of sugar sweetened stuff. And we need to identify this, these steps of adequacy. So nutrient adequacy, is something that uh, has been studied for a very long time. It's still very important, but our real contribution is to think about the overall healthy diet in terms of dietary guidelines. When we do that, we and we think about the cost of all foods, we're moving away from just measuring inflation, using the same items that are used to measure inflation, but we're weighting items by their nutritional value uh, for least cost ways of meeting um, healthy diets. And that moves away from previous work that had just focused on a few farm commodities. Our most recent innovation in this work is to collaborate with an enormous number of nutritionists around the world, including in the FAO. I see Lynette Neufeld, for example, um, the uh, director for nutrition in the FAO um, is, is you know, in this group and many others have been in dialogue about this, uh, where the idea is to think about a, a minimalist, simple definition of uh, a healthy diet, which um, doesn't meet all requirements for a healthy diet, but meets most of them. So the goal is to meet a majority of different national governments' health uh, goals in terms of their food-based dietary guidelines. And we do that in a, in a minimalist way that I'll show you in just a minute. So the idea is to specify targets in food groups that directly reflect the food guides and the quantified um, recommendations by food group that are used in the United States and in, in what's now my plate, uh, but in every other country around the world that has a published uh, food-based dietary guideline and to aggregate up over all of these food-based dietary guidelines, something that would reflect the national government policies regarding what is a healthy diet. Uh, our insight is first to ensure that all 
uh, diets are within energy balance across food groups by converting the volume and weight of any item to its calorie composition so that the calorie weights of the different food groups can be uh, respected as people switch between items depending on the prices and the local availability of different kinds of items uh, to, to, to determine diet cost. Um, for SOFI 2020, we used the median cost of meeting these particular 10 different uh, dietary guidelines. And the reason was to have all UN regions represented. Now what we have is a single dietary guideline, a single healthy diet basket that's derived from a larger number of guidelines, all of whom have a quantifiable food guide of this nature, the type of thing you're seeing here. When we group these, we find that identifying six food groups allows meeting a majority of them and also achieving nutrient adequacy so that we, relative to DRIs, get to nutrient adequate diets. So this is the dietary basket that meets most dietary guidelines and achieves nutrient adequacy. When you have the two least cost starchy staples up to a total of 1160 calories, 110 calories from three different vegetables, 160 calories in two different fruits, and so forth. Um, you can see the kinds of quantities that you get, and you see the typical volumes in terms of plate share. Now, different items in each food group have very different uh, water weight, and so our central insight in making this an automated algorithm-based sort of big data process is by converting items to their uh, energy, you get the uh, overall healthy diet basket balanced across types of foods. So here's just three examples of specific healthy diet baskets uh, in selected countries of interest. Chose Italy just uh, to think about what's outside the FAO headquarters. Um, but if you were to go in the 2017 data from the International Comparison Program, which is the global collection of retail prices um, that's most um, widely used in uh, research on retail markets around the world for everything, not just food, but in, we use it for food, of course. What you find is the least cost starchy staples in Italy, in Senegal, and Pakistan have some reflection of the local food system. Uh, so in, in Italy, two least cost starchy staples, you'd have wheat, flour, and pasta, of course, both based on wheat. In Senegal, you'd have a bigger role for rice. Um, in Pakistan, a bigger role uh, for maize as well as in Senegal. Among the vegetables, some global blockbuster vegetables, uh, carrots and onions typically show up as least cost items, uh, but the third item might be different, locally specific kind of item. Uh, fruits, similarly, highly localized, not that much international trade in fruit, and so the least cost fruit typically varies by location, and you can see how it sort of makes sense in terms of the, um, the, the, the local agro ecosystem, and you can also see how important it is to use calories as the basis, so think of dried dates versus mangoes. Among animal source foods, you can see the mix. And here, the crucial thing really is this low-cost dairy in high-income countries makes a very big role, not typically present in low-income countries. Although in Pakistan, they do have a dairy sector relatively low cost. Uh, best least cost uh, uh, pulses, nuts, and seeds differ a fair bit around countries. Uh, and, and the least cost oil might differ a bit. So you can see how when we do this work around the world, you know, what do we get? We get very low cost caloric adequacy, roughly $2 a day for nutrient adequacy, roughly $3.50 a day for overall healthy diets. Um, least cost items, they just have different, you know, different products, but similar prices because they cost a similar amount to make, except for dairy, which is low cost in high income countries. Uh, so what we found is this pattern of, in, of people cannot afford sufficient daily energy. Um, primarily in Central Africa, people cannot afford a nutrient adequate diet all across Africa and to some degree South Asia, and people cannot afford a healthy diet in a much wider range of settings. So this is really a global issue of social protection as well as food system transformation. And it compares to the other kinds of metrics uh, in very interesting ways. So you can see how it's a larger total number of people who cannot afford a healthy diet than any of the other metrics that we use. Uh, because it's a broader concept. It's a more advanced concept. Um, and these latest updates in the 2021 SOFI uh, and the FAO will be publishing new updates for the 2022 SOFI. Does adding sustainability and moving towards true cost uh, change things? Well, no. For the SOFI 2020, we looked at this question using the Eat Lancet reference diet, and we see that the green line here is no different from the purple line in the sense that at each level of income, there is simply no difference between meeting sustainability criteria and meeting overall other kinds of dietary guidelines. There just isn't a difference because the 
low cost healthy foods already use very few of the unsustainable resource intensive, uh, more costly animal foods. We have done a lot of work on heterogeneity by type of person. So in particular, this shows cost per day of the nutrient adequate as nutrients need, nutrient needs differ by age and sex. You see this cost per day is highest for adolescents. Anybody who has a, an adolescent boy in their household would know they eat uh, a lot of food um, and it's more costly than the uh, least cost items for any other age and sex group. Uh, but during lactation is particularly high total energy and nutrient requirements. So a lactating woman is the same high level of cost per day as, a, as an adolescent uh, male. And the cost per calorie in terms of diet quality, the mix of foods to meet that balance, uh, to meet energy balance in, with high diet quality, that's um, particularly expensive for girls and women. We see a lot of insight from within country research. So a big part of this agenda is not just compare across countries, but look within, think about seasonality. You see this pattern differing by region, trying to understand how food systems can achieve healthy diets for all year round in all parts of the country. Um, and you can see how there's evolution over time as well, and trying to make sure that uh, periods of scarcity, such as the current crisis caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as uh, many other factors, and of course, COVID is taken into account. The COVID agenda, we've done some work on that, and Tufts generally, uh, a lot of very interesting work on um, how COVID and uh, respiratory illnesses that restrict um, that, that lead to social distancing, um, both policy lockdowns and also people voluntarily separating from each other, um, that makes it expensive to have food. And so food prices, what you see here is that food prices have risen above overall prices in a way that's very characteristic uh, and is being recognized now um, increasingly uh, around the world. Um, this is associated with cumulative case counts and we're moving ahead to, to do that uh, work sort of more precisely to think about how COVID plays out in altering food prices, retail food prices, not the wholesale that are in the World Food Price Index, for example. Um, we're also trying to move beyond, and this gets to true cost accounting, to think about the cost within the household beyond the market, looking, for example, at the cost of cooking fuel. So this is work with Cheryl. Um, uh, Hendricks that she'll talk about in just a moment, thinking about um, cost of meal preparation and just the astronomically high cost of fuel in many countries, such as cooking uh, beans, for example, dried beans, the fuel cost alone, let alone the uh, water and time, is rivals the cost of the beans themselves. Um, and as you might know, natural gas prices uh, have spiked, so households that are reliant on natural gas in particular paying much more right now. So how do we move towards true cost accounting? Now that we have, for the first time, retail market prices for all these items processed in a way that we can aggregate up across countries in a standardized way, we can begin to think about these environmental costs that have been emphasized, but also Tufts has been doing a lot of work um, on, on kind of social costs uh, and, and of course on health costs of unhealthy foods. But the key insight that I think is very, very helpful is to think about external benefits at the same time so that we're not just focusing on true cost accounting, but also true value of food. And the enormous benefits that these healthy foods deliver when they're produced on the farm in a regenerative manner, when they're processed and distributed in a socially responsible manner, and when their meal preparation and consumption is in service of, of good health. These can be enormous merit goods, positive be external benefits to society that we ignore if we just focus on uh, the environmental damage, which is real, but so is the health benefit of beneficial foods. And then the third column here shows transfers. Transfers are when policy means that one group of people in society, instead of imposing costs on others or benefits on others, simply incurs a transfer to or from others. So the classic examples would be just the government uses tax revenue to provide a payment to farmers when they do a certain thing. Uh, but there could also be uh, competition policy and monopolies and monopsonies when there's a, a company is making ex excess profits um, that's protected by government or um, government policy might, might restrict it. 
So what do we do? When we do this, we find plenty of examples to quantify the external costs of, plenty of examples to quantify the external benefits of, and plenty of examples to quantify transfers of each type of food when we think about how current policies fail to control for external costs. So these examples are central to true cost accounting, but so could be these other examples. We could proceed rigorously and systematically to catalog all of these kinds of external costs and compare them to all these kinds of external benefits and find which types of food supply chains are delivering these social benefits in addition to those that might be incurring these social costs. And similarly on health, that we are attentive, not just to these health costs of unhealthy foods, but also the, the positive value of healthy foods. So we can do this kind of accounting in a way that would allow us to add things up and add them up in a rigorous manner to think about um, cost benefit. And I think that this is something that, um, that Kathleen Merrigan will talk about in the next panel as we think about how these cost benefit calculations can be uh, institutionalized within governments uh, to guide policy decisions where we're thinking about the impacts per unit of each activity. We're thinking about how much that's worth to people uh, in, that, in that society and what is the total net value when we've accounted for all of these transfers as well as the external health gains or other gains uh, in it, not just the external environmental costs, which we've quite rightly thought about as the starting place for true cost accounting. So in conclusion, you know, we have this world food system that simply does not supply healthy diets at an affordable price for too many people, uh, roughly 40% of the world. It's just too costly to grow and distribute these uh, perishable or bulky healthy foods. Starchy staples, vegetable oil and sugar have approximately the same cost per calorie, the lowest cost per calorie uh, of all type of foods in the world. And these other foods are just more expensive, more costly, more difficult to do. Seasonality within countries makes a big difference. Price volatility makes a big difference, but just on average, they're just really expensive and we need to make them cheaper. Make them cheaper through productive technology and lower real costs, not just subsidies when we think about true cost accounting. So affordability, you're gonna need income growth, you're gonna need safety nets, not just lower prices because there's a limit to how much lower the prices can get. Um, and adding sustainability criteria is not really what's going on here. This is just about the difficulty of meeting the health needs of people with these relatively costly types of food to grow. For most people, healthy diets are there, they're affordable. Uh, you know, within a half an hour travel distance, you could acquire these uh, foods, that, but people eat other things. Why? Because all these other factors matter so much. Um, healthy foods are simply displaced by unhealthy foods uh, for all of these, these reasons. And adding externalities is absolutely central to the next stages of this work on, on food prices to think about true prices, where we're thinking about a complete accounting framework, benefits as well as costs, social and health as well as environmental, and transfers as well as externalities. So I believe that you can sort of imagine what this would look like and that it's a very exciting agenda because we're thinking about all these benefits of the food system when done well, we're thinking about uh, costs and benefits in a way that can be actionable to governments and has been, as I hope Kathleen Merrigan will share, um, and that these accounting frameworks permit very large scale data collection and analysis. So I really appreciate the chance to share this briefly you know, with you now. I think you know, there's tons of work behind this that you can see um, that the Sophie and Maximo's leadership at the FAO, uh, but also now Lynette Neufeld and many others in the FAO and in other agencies, um, really taking this uh, in a dramatically uh, promising way in the world uh, governance structures and then within national governments, many collaborators doing so as well, um, and making sure that the research community has access to detailed data, uh, which we'll be doing through this World Bank data hub and, um, and, and many, many, many researchers. So many researchers have been involved in this work I really appreciate the chance to talk talk with you about it now. Thank you. Thank you, Will. We'll have lots to talk about. Before I turn it over to uh, Roy, I was remiss in not mentioning uh, that Roy is a uh, senior vice president of food at Rockefeller Foundation. <clears throat> and with that, if Roy, if I could hand it over to you. 
Great, thank you so much, Eileen. And, and Will, uh, uh, thank you for that presentation and, and Maximo for the incredible work that you guys are, are doing. I mean, I, it's, it's really very valuable and really pushing forward our understanding uh, of, of, of how we have to shift the food system. So um, hats off to, to, to you on that. Um, you know, as, as um, Darius mentioned, uh, we uh, at the Rockefeller Foundation funded this, this significant study on, on looking at the true cost of food, and in, but just for the United States. And, and the, the numbers that Darius um, laid out, you know, when you step back, you realize, you know, we really have created a value destroying system. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and yet the food system can be a value creating system if we make better choices. And I think that's one of the reasons why when we, uh, when we put out this report, we had actually quite a number of policymakers reach out to us in the US, USDA, the Office of Management and Budget, various state officials, because they, they are seeing, they, 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 they are uh, experiencing the, the challenge of, uh, of these costs uh, they're very real, um, and we only try measured the ones that you you had a, a pretty good basis for putting a dollar figure on. Um, there's a lot of things you can't. Uh, it's very difficult to put dollar figures on, uh, but are extraordinarily important. And I feel that's one of the the challenges. For example, equity. How do you put a dollar figure on that? Yet, if you don't put a dollar figure on that, you're actually uh, valuing it at zero, which we ended up doing, but feeling not very good about. Even if you don't include all the really hard things, you, you, you do uh, have a system that is destroying value. And I think we have to be looking at all the things that Will has laid out uh, to, to start addressing that. I mean, it, it is encouraging that, you know, the, uh, the healthy, lowest cost healthy foods are also have kind of the lowest environmental impact. I think we have to move more into that and understanding that and, and how do you actually help uh, shift the system? I mean, the, you know, when you look at you know, where, for example, research dollars are going in the agricultural system, something like 80% really go to four crops. Yet, if we want, really wanna have efficiency as, as Maximo and, and Will have talked about, we need a lot more investment in figuring out how to, how to create more, more uh, efficient systems. Uh, similarly, you know, we there, there's a lot of talk about regenerative agriculture now, and, and the importance of of shifting these systems because the environmental um, costs, the biodiversity loss, are are so significant. Um, there there is indication that you actually can create regenerative systems that are actually much more profitable, but that's also going to take knowledge and and effort and and different ways of of supporting the, those 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 systems. And I think the you know policymakers, researchers need to be be looking at that. Um, and and I think the food crisis. This is a time uh, to really get the world to think about doing things differently um, because uh, it, it, it it's only going to get harder. You know, we, I think all of us who are kind of immersed right now in, in the implications of the of the Ukraine invasion and 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 the re, re, ripple effect in the food system. Um, are, are aware that, that policymakers are actually listening uh, to an extent I haven't heard before. But how do we use this time to actually shift the system so that it is more regenerative, it is more healthy as we try to address uh, the, the, the huge challenges that I think um, uh, so many countries around the world are, are going. Two, I, I know I'm, my time is short, Eileen, so I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll stop here. But a couple of one little thing, you know, on meal preparation, and I'm glad Cheryl and others are looking at that. Uh, fascinating point, you know, we are um, at Rockefeller, we've launched this Global Energy Alliance, which is really about helping create solar uh, power and mini grids in particular. One of the most successful um, uses of the solar energy that is being put into villages all over is so solar uh, electric powered um, pressure cookers which not only dramatically lower the cost of meal preparation, but also lower the amount of time. And we're seeing real uptake uh, by that. And so there's a, it's a real, it's an, a great example of a win-win. Not only are you decarbonizing the, the uh, you know, helping decarbonize the food system, but you're also lowering costs and uh, in, 
of giving time back to the women and the family. So, and I think we, there's a lot of, I think these opportunities to make things better. Um, yeah, and then of course, local production, kitchen gardens, there's all kinds of um, shifts that I think can be um, very powerful. So with that, let me hand it up back to uh, Eileen or, or to-, to uh, Oh, thank the sure. really interesting more. Thank you, we'll, we'll get back to you with a lot of questions, but now I think we move on to, uh, to uh, Cheryl. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you to um, FAO and um, to Tufts for the opportunity to share some of the work of the Food Systems Summit Scientific Group um, that was asked to look at this issue as it ro arose in the discussions around the Food Systems Summit. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll jump to one slide just to, to show you um, some of the work um, that was done as part of this. I think as um, Will pointed out that very often people jump to the assumption that we're talking about raising food prices. And I think this work that's done by the Impact Institute um, shows that um, there are many different ways of reducing the costs of production. And this is done quite efficiently through some of the conservation agriculture approaches. And so in the, in the first um, box is about producing coffee in Mexico. And you can see that the cost related to the price to farmers, the social costs and the natural costs for using conservation agriculture are significantly lower than traditional and um, uh, commercial ways of producing coffee. The same with bananas. They did a really interesting study that showed that fair trade um, production of bananas was $2 per box lower than your conventional um, approaches to producing bananas. But yet when you buy fair trade bananas in the supermarket, that price is not realized by the consumer. So there's some really, um, distorting practices and policies that lead us to making um, some of the more sustainable and more efficient approaches more expensive at the retail point. Um, and those benefits are not being passed on to the farmers. And so what is the incentive really for farmers to engage in fair trade and conservation kind of approaches? So there's a lot we need to do about thinking about the, how do we incentivize um, the saving of costs and also saving the, of the environment, but also producing healthier diets um, and making the reverse, um, the, a disincentive for, for uh, producers, marketers, and for retailers. And then of course, co educating consumers around this component is also really important. So there are clever ways of doing it. And it's not that we don't know how to do this. Um, it's about making sure that this becomes the norm and not the exception to the rule. So the study um, that the scientific group embarked on used global data, um, so a range of of data, food price, environmental data, health cost data, diet scenarios, and trade data to look at the current global foods, the cost of producing food in the current system, and also then what are the dietary shifts. And the outcome of this study showed us quite dramatic results um, that of the $9 trillion um, of food that changes hands in the, in the world in a year, we, we are um, generating 7 trillion costs in environmental costs, 11 trillion in terms of unhealthy diets and the cost to human life, and then 1 trillion in terms of direct economic costs for unhealthy diets. So this is typically your health sector direct costs. So you can see that um, we are generating <laughs> significant um, what we call the hidden costs in the food system. And this really, really does need to be addressed in the system. And I'm sure Daniel will speak more to this later because Daniel's one of the brains behind the actual quantification um, of these amounts. Um, and so, but in the system, you, you re recognize that there are so many unknowns and so many pieces of missing data that we need to consider. So this was a preliminary assessment, the first that did, that, that looked at environmental and um, health outcomes but there's a great deal more of work to be done. 
So for example, um, the, the data is based on trade data. So it doesn't consider whether you're looking at a raw organically produced tomato that's eaten in your salad or a sugar laden bottle of ketchup. Um, so the, the data at the moment is not able to distinguish. Those clearly have very different health impacts. And so we need to look at them. And um, the whole processing component and the use of energy, as Maximo pointed out, is very high in the processing sector. And so these are, are elements we're not really considering in the current assessments um, of the true um, value of food. The whole plastic debate and how plastics um, are polluting the environment. So France, for example, has gone for no plastics on vegetables as a way of reducing the environmental impact. And all of these have links to fertilizer, food and fuel. Um, so we don't have data, for example, a good data on antimicrobial herbicide and pesticide use. So the links of, to health of those are unknown. Um, and so, and air pollution and water data is also not as well defined as what we, we should um, have. Of course, you've mentioned already the impact of COVID, particularly on non-communicable diseases, um, has major impacts um, for the future of our food systems. And so we really have to look at the quality of the food um, that we are consuming. Um, so we'll mention the consumer price index and most of those baskets are not based on a healthy food basket. So even um, accounting for inflation is not really accurate based. It's a, many countries are fairly random <laughs> basket of food and not necessarily linked to the food-based dietary guidelines. So we need to think about lots more elements um, that will alluded to around equitable food systems as well and access to food. Um, and, and the kinds of, of labor um, that's used in food systems. Um, and also the, looking at the entire food system and helping the different components, different stakeholders in the food system to understand the value at those various different points. So that we get a holistic perspective um, of the choices we make from production through to consumption. So I think I'll leave it for the leave it there for now, Ali. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to direct questions to uh, the appropriate person, but some of them is for everyone, Will, Roy, uh, Cheryl. Let me start with, and this is a, sometimes when I bring up this question, uh, it's in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, people think I'm joking, but when I was involved with the HLPE report, I was on the HLPE uh, for the UN Committee on World Food Security, the report on nutrition and food systems. We spent a lot of time trying to define a healthy diet. And I think it's one of these terms that people, you know, we use all the time and we think we know what it is. Uh, but what was very clear was that um, in this report, uh, national food-based dietary guidelines are not diets. I mean, there are underpinnings to diet, reduce sodium, whatever, eat more fruits and vegetables or, you know, decrease, decrease saturated fat. So there was a question which is intriguing in the uh, question box. Uh, what you, and I'll start with you, Will, do you think Michael Pollan's suggestion that eat food, mostly plants and not too much, is an accurate definition of a healthy diet? Yeah, it cer certainly is one of the most famous definitions of a healthy diet. Um, I think the short answer is it depends on which plants. Um, so clearly a diet that is plant-based, but does not have the fruits, the vegetables, uh, and the legumes, pulses, nuts, and seeds that are in the healthy diet basket that we use as our definition of healthy diets for least cost affordability questions, um, you know, is, is missing the mark. Um, so Michael Pollan knows that a simple message is better than a right message, a correct message, mm -hmm. if you're in the business of selling books. Um, but I think it could be just a little bit expanded to be eat food, uh, a balance of plants, um, and uh, and not too much. You know, and, and this gets to a separate question from Gregory Miller about aren't costs based on the metric you choose, cost per weight or cost per nutrient density or cost per calorie. And that's absolutely true. One of the core, and I would say probably the core 
trick that allows us to ingest enormous numbers of food prices. In other words, complete the calculation for a healthy diet that meets dietary guidelines and meets nutrient adequacy to do that on a calculating many, many. So we've done this millions of times, literally millions of diets around the world, the specific food item at each market location every month. That's possible by converting all foods to calories. Um, and the reason you wanna do that is because you wanna meet dietary guidelines and achieve nutrient adequacy for micronutrients, vitamins and minerals and uh, proteins, fats, uh, as well as carbohydrates um, to, and fiber to do that in a way that um, is, that respects the not too much part of the micropollen definition um, and the precise calorie balance in each diet uh, component, each of the food groups, um, and that is done on a per calorie basis. So obviously people aren't eating vegetables for the calories, but you want to have enough vegetables uh, to meet your micronutrient needs and enough fruits and enough balance between them. And you do that on a, by measuring on a calorie basis. Thanks, Will. Uh, Roy, the, um, the Rockefeller Foundation report, and I know you were involved on the uh, uh, true cost accounting, uh, uh, very valuable, lots of circulation. I uh, actually was interviewed several times by people from the McKinsey Group who helped with it. And one of the issues that's come up from uh, the general audience, not just me, the general audience that looked at this is, uh, and I think you use the term, Roy, assumptions. Um, do you believe that the assumptions around some of the uh, metrics related to the environment are more solid than some of the metrics related to um, the more health nutrition related aspects? And there's a specific question to you on, um, have you or will you consider incorporating the time cost in your framework? Um, so you're absolutely right that, you know, the assumptions are, are key. You know, one of the reasons we actually put all the assumptions online, you know, I, mean, I think one of the, uh, you know, arguments uh, or disagreements with a lot of true cost accounting is that it feels like it's a black box. And I think, you know, we, we actually put the entire spreadsheet, every single assumption, every single reference so that if you disagreed with the assumption, you could just change it and then you could just see what, what, what impact that would have on the overall cost. Um, what is interesting is that you know, the folks, the few folks that actually go in there, you can disagree with the assumptions, but the overall message is still the same. We've cre created a value destroying system. And uh, uh, I think we can continue to refine the true cost accounting. Absolutely. I think the assumptions are are going to get it better and better and all the work that Will and Maximo exactly, exactly are doing. On the time cost, we, we actually didn't include that in, in there. It was just hard to measure. Uh, and so if we, if we didn't have good, solid economic numbers, we didn't include it, uh, which, as I said before, is a problem because that actually essentially says it's worth zero. Um, but we wanted to make the general point is <laughs> that the food system needs transformation. And and, and we didn't want to get into arguments that, oh, if you, if people can pick things and then and, and take away from the overall message um, if, if you aren't as, as solid. So we, we, we erred on the side of being extremely conservative with, um, uh, with, with the, the recognition that there's more work to be done and there's many uh, areas of value that have to be incorporated for a, for a fully comprehensive true cost analysis. Yeah, thank you. And again, I'm uh, uh, a great user of the report, including with my graduate master's and doctoral students, I use the report. So thank you for that contribution. I'm gonna ask a question to Cheryl and then Will at the same time, a little bit different, but Cheryl, um, your uh, paper that you did for the scientific group, again, was uh, instrumental in generating a lot of discussion as a ramp up to the uh, food system summit. Um, there were a lot of areas you delved into talking about huge gaps. It, it, what would you see are the top two or three areas of research that are needed in order to um, advance uh, knowledge around um, what to do with true cost accounting? And then for Will, we had a specific question 
why are you, uh, I'll read it, why are you using the uh, Lancet Eat series? Uh, because it actually uh, is deficient in some particular nutrients. So I wonder how you would deal with that. But let's start with Cheryl. We want your, you. Cheryl, we want your wisdom on what we, where we should be investing as we move forward. <laughs> Yeah, I think the social and the economic components are the two that really need um, our detailed attention. Um, the nutrition side in terms of systematic reviews that um, help us to understand how we actually quantify the impact of diets and particularly unhealthy diets. Uh, for example, insulin has been completely ignored by much of the, of the research. Um, and that's very important, particularly in the, in the food system transformation, where more and more processed food is starting to be consumed. So I think updating our knowledge on some of the emerging research that's coming out um, of the direct link um, of dietary patterns uh, we need a lot more regional data and um, uh, because the regional patterns are very different. I mean, we saw that from Will's three examples. So um, generalizing at the global level is one thing, but getting down to the, to, the, to the regional level. But very often there's missing data, especially in the developed world. Um, and the, what we really do need to keep an eye on is the shift towards a more westernized diet in a developing world. And so then a tomato and a ketchup cannot possibly be compared. Um, so at, at the deeper level of, of the analysis. On the social side, then we need to work more with the, with the people, the ILO, with people working in the labor industry. Um, there's a lot more sex disaggregated data there. It is becoming available, but the integration of these, and Daniel can talk to more because I have great respect for, for the enormous task that they did, that they undertook to actually bring all that data together. And I think that's so we also need those data scientists who are able to integrate huge blocks of data to bring and make sense to these components. So I think we need to we need to advance on a number of fronts um, simultaneously and to work together. Partnerships are going to be really important. Thanks, Ali. Thank you, Cheryl. And I think that later on in the next session, we'll hear from Daniel, who was intimately involved in uh, some modeling related to uh, various aspects, including the cost of the Lancet dive. But uh, Will, why did you pick that one? Um, yeah, so first of all, just to follow you know, directly on Cheryl's point, I, I think this, this idea that this is a research agenda, that there's so many open questions uh, and so much need for collaboration to assemble the data and find ways to compare, as I was trying to communicate in, in, in my slides about compare the benefits, the costs, and these transfers with the taxes and subsidies uh, from one group of people to another within the country. Um, so we're not just thinking about environmental costs only, but also these benefits. That requires multi-institutional collaboration because no one uh, institution or person um, can possibly have the kinds of data that you would need for that. And so this coalition of researchers looking for better evidence in a framework that allows us to add these things up um, is the goal here, as opposed to saying, no, we know now what the costs are. Um, take that pioneering work from the Rockefeller Foundation, take the pioneering work from the uh, Food System Summit um, that Daniel will talk about, I hope in a bit more depth soon, you know, and, 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 and go to the next steps and the next steps and the next steps in a way that can deliver results you know, year after year as we learn more. Um, and then that interesting question about Eat Lancet. So of course we don't use Eat Lancet. We don't endorse, don't use, it's not part of our program. Um, I showed you briefly a slide with it in order to mm. reveal that adding the sustainability criteria does not raise cost. Mm. So that's a, an astonishing thing because people typically think that sustainable foods are more expensive, don't you know? And healthy foods, people will also argue, are more expensive, don't you know? That they'll say healthy and sustainable foods are more expensive. But it turns out that that's not correct. When you think about the actual composition of foods, and when you think about the actual footprint of foods, it turns out that the um, more highly uh, you know, ultra-processed and um, with ingredients that are uh, hyper palatable and processing that makes them hyper palatable, plus all of the marketing, the advertising, the uh, extraordinary depths of distribution to ensure that in every village you can get, you know, refrigerated Coca Cola or whatever. Like that, 
is actually expensive. Um, so it turns out the Coca-Cola is really expensive, actually, really. And it's people are buying it for other reasons, not because it's cheap. So when you look at the least cost items, they're both healthy and sustainable. They meet that Michael Pollan definition, eat food, mostly plants, uh, but a particular balance of plants in our case, um, and they are sustainable. So we do not use Eat Lancet. The main reason we don't use Eat Lancet in particular is because it's not a government policy. So our work is fundamentally rooted in national government policies for a very deep, powerful reason, which is that these are the official statements of the elected governments uh, of the countries in the world that we that do provide quantitative guidelines. Eileen mentioned that in food-based dietary guidelines, there's a lot of information such as eat less sodium, uh, a lot of information such as, you know, the US recently introduced and is debating about uh, alcohol, for example. Um, we do not address those parts of the dietary guidelines. We extract from the dietary guidelines the relative balance of the plate devoted to uh, fruits, vegetables, pulses, nuts, and seeds, as opposed to animal source foods and, um, and starchy staples and vegetable oil, um, and compute you know, from there. So our goal is to not use the diet, not use Eat Lancet at all because it's not a government policy, um, to focus on what elected or otherwise uh, empowered national governments that are members of the United Nations uh, and the member governments of the, of the World Bank, um, what those governments have declared is their definition of a healthy diet, and that's what we use um, to find whether food systems uh, provide those foods at an affordable price. Well, that, that, that clarifies that, Will. Thank you. It, the reason I bring off uh, national food-based dietary guidelines, I was involved in several go-rounds in the U.S., and it's very confusing to consumers. And when you take sodium, eat less sodium, that, that's not what does that mean? What's the menu you use or what's the approach you use? But anyway, it's a whole other topic. Um, you mentioned, Will, and we're getting a couple of questions here on, uh, I'm going to have a question for Will, Roy, Cheryl, it's a little different, but you mentioned or not mentioned, but uh, there's a lot of questions on what is the role uh, of animal so source foods, protein quality in general, in some of your calculations. Uh, they're sometimes is the sense that when you use a uh, true value of food, that it's an anti-animal source protein message. So that's that's number one. Roy, in, in uh, I'm glad you clarified the uh, Rockefeller Foundation report uh, was limited or not limited, but was focused on the United States. Uh, what was the, uh, how did you incorporate processed foods in thinking about uh, their cost and benefits. Uh, and Cheryl, uh, on the Eat Lancet series, which I know you've reviewed a lot, uh, is, this, is there any um, thought that maybe this would be a useful dietary pattern for low and middle income countries? But I'll start with you, Will, animal source protein. Yeah, so in reviewing national food-based dietary guidelines around the world, this is actually one of the most vexing Question. So what are national policies around the world on animal source foods as a part of a healthy diet as far as um, government policy is concerned? As far as, you know, medical consensus is concerned, um, you know, there's high requirements relative to current actual intake in low and middle income countries of, of calcium, of B12, and other foods that are lowest cost when obtained from animal sources. So from a medical perspective, uh, animal sources can be the least cost sources of those two micronutrients in particular. Um, there's also a comment about protein uh, quality um, and so forth, which we address as well. But from a national government's point of view, there are many, many national governments that do require animal source foods in their overall healthy diet basket. Um, there are others that don't, um, but they differ a lot in what particular animal source foods they do require. So in the United States and in a couple of other countries require what is actually a prodigious amount of milk, um, more than people typically drink. Um, other dietary guidelines specify fish. Other dietary guidelines specify um, different foods. What they don't specify is beef. And beef is the outlier uh, carbon emissions and methane emission um, uh, worst offender in terms of harming future generations uh, when meeting current consumption uh, desires. Um, so beef is never included in a least cost healthy diet. Beef as such um, 
because it's just not least cost. Uh, sorry, it's not, it's not never liquid. It is sometimes a very, a very low cost item actually. Um, in a few food systems, it does appear as a low cost item sometimes. Uh, but in the main, the vast majority of the time, um, beef is expensive in the marketplace, just as it is harmful to the environment and just as it is not necessary for health. We eat beef for other reasons. And that's, that's a, yeah, so that's a very, a, a, well, sorry, I did interrupt, I'm sorry. That's somewhat of a, um, a US perspective. Let me explain because you talked about a role of animal source foods, quantity is important by the way in the diet, but kind of taking it the next link, what are the implications for health and nutrition and I know a big issue, I don't know if Jamie wants to jump in on this one, but a big issue in the UN system is the appropriate level of uh, animal source foods in order to promote optimum growth, particularly in preschool age children. Now you've honed in on diet, which is fair enough, that's the work you're doing, but above and beyond diet, uh, there are very strong data that animal source foods for certain groups have uh, enormous, enormous positive effect. And does that affect your calculation at all? Absolutely, yes, yes, absolutely. So in our healthy diet basket, the amount of animal source foods that is, um, is required is 300 calories out of the 2300 total. Um, so 300 calories, as you saw from the three examples uh, that I showed, could be, um, uh, it, I'll just look at it quickly. It's uh, 200 grams of milk in the Italy case uh, and 68 grams of chicken. Um, in the Senegal case, it's uh, 36 grams each of two different kinds of uh, small fish. And in the Pakistan case, it's 150 grams of buffalo milk, uh, and again, 68 grams of chicken, same as uh, the chicken in Italy. So you can see the kinds of foods that meet those B12 needs, the calcium needs, the other micronutrient needs that animal source foods distinctively provide. Um, and of course, as Eileen said, there's this crucial question of infant feeding. Uh, and so exclusive breastfeeding to six months, followed by introduction of nutrient dense, uh, nutrient dense complementary foods to complement continued breastfeeding up to two years, and then the family diet, you know, that's a crucial question uh, that is not what we're talking about here. Um, and clearly low income people are eating much, much less than this animal source 300 uh, calories a day um, that's in the healthy diet basket. That there would need to be a substantial increase in animal source food consumption in order to meet this healthy diet basket that represents global uh, dietary guidelines. Thanks, Will. Now, Roy, I think the issue of processed foods, uh, I'm just reading into sort of kind of the uh, intent that processed foods, um, however you're defining them, um, are more negative than positive. And I wonder, and talking about your, um, what I call one to three, a true cost accounting, how do you, how do you uh, come out there? Yeah, so um, there are many people on this call that could answer this question better than me, but uh, I, I'm I not, doubt it, but go ahead. I'm, I'm not a nutritionist, but, but it, it does seem pretty clear that ultra processed foods, and there's a way, different ways to measure that uh, or define that, are, are, are really, that's, that's the biggest problem in our diets because uh, we have created diets that are just so out of balance from any sort of natural uh, diet that we've evolved with. Um, and you know, and it's interesting when, when some of the folks, uh, and Darius could speak to this, when you look at uh, diets with lots of ultra processed foods, they, you know, the, you'll, you'll, you'll get proportions of specific biomolecules that would never exist uh, in, in, in the history of humanity. And it, and it causes all this metabolic syndrome and all of these, this inflammation in the body, et cetera. Uh, and, and, so, and so I think, you know, that is a, a huge issue and we do need to move to, as, as Michael Pollan said, you know, good food or, or other people said, you know, feed the gut and protect the liver. We, we don't have diets that do that. And it's resulting in, in these extraordinary health, health costs. And I think people forget how expensive uh, dietary related diseases are. You know, you just take diabetes alone uh, that's $327 billion to put, uh, uh, each year in the United States alone. One diet-related disease costs that much money. To put that in context, the entire global fertilizer industry is $180 billion. So one disease, the cost of one disease is twice the entire global fertilizer industry. Um, so, you know, we've created these, uh, and, and a lot of that I think can be tr triggered to 
uh, the, the kind of food systems we've created with ultra-processed. I think there's lots of issues around uh, antibiotics in our system that mm -hmm. are just coming uh, coming out. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, 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 this wasn't in the question, Roy, but I think one of the reasons this has come up is, uh, as you know, a lot of uh, countries, low and middle income included, are pursuing uh, fortification policies as a way of targeting specific nutrient deficits. And so sometimes this broad brush um, you know, no processed foods is misplaced, but I noticed you did mention the, the term ultra processed foods. So maybe sort of different characterization there. <laughs> yeah, and, and fortification, see here's another thing is, <laughs> I think we do some very crazy things, right? We, we take a, a whole grain, which is full of, you know, 26 minerals and vitamins. We strip all that nutrition out into refined grain, and then we add one, one vitamin back in and call it fortified flour. It, it's ridiculous. We, we need to be feeding kids, for example, whole grains that are fortified. Uh, but the fact that we uh, do this manipulation of the food to make it less healthy and then somehow label it as healthy is, is I think, problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheryl, perspective, uh, your take on low and middle income countries. Yes, yeah, so even the Eat Lancet report had a caveat about related to Africa, in fact, saying that perhaps more animal source foods were needed in Africa. And we know that to be particularly true um, in terms of nutrient density and addressing stunting in children in Africa. Um, so uh, there's a lot, even the Lancet report needs to be continually updated to account for new research that is emerging and changes in data. Um, but I do think we need a more regional approach. Um, your food groups differ so much across different um, countries that you can't have a one size fits all across the country. And a recent paper by Kate um, Burt really does put um, a different lens uh, uh, on for us to consider, talking about the whiteness of dietary recommendations. Yeah. Um, and that many are European based and that perhaps we need a far more contextual approach. And the Food Systems Summit um, brought that to light very clearly that context really matters. So culture matters because you can have a perfectly prescribed diet, but if people don't eat those foods, there's no point if it's not grown there, there's, um, you know, people are not going to be familiar with it. So we need a lot more contextual understanding. Um, and yeah, and across, even across different countries, animal production systems are very different. They're not also the same. Um, and so we need to think, for example, Many animals in Africa are grazed on land that cannot be used for anything else. So it's not a waste, it's actually a, a value add to the environmental system. Um, so the values need to be interpreted in terms of the particular context um, for, that, for that particular group. Phil, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to read this next question, Will, because I want to get the wording right. It's from Adam Drunowski, who you know has been doing a lot of work over the years on nutrient density. And he says, I seem to remember from Economic Research Service, USDA, uh, something published in AJCN in 2011 that, quote, energy adjusted food costs made little economic sense. Hmm. You're an economist. Well, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, Adam, I'll, I'll, I'll look to see what the, um, that letter was in AJCN. I don't recall at the moment what particular point that was, um, but I do think that trying to find ways that extract from this extraordinary cultural diversity that, I, that Cheryl just described, um, all the differences in the national food systems that give, in the end, these marketplaces, the amazing diversity. I mean, I don't know if you're like me, but you know, when I travel, like even for tourism, like my wife and I, you know, we'll, like, we'll just go to food markets basically, and both grocery stores and open uh, wet, wet markets um, and just explore, and you see this, you know, amazing diversity, and you just try to see what each cuisine is, and um, and what what it's made from, and and extract what is the common thing. Because under the skin, while the Mediterranean diet, you know, is like this white person thing from the Mediterranean, um, you know, healthy diets, and our healthy diet basket isn't that at all. So our healthy diet basket is chapati and dal, is you know, black beans and rice is whatever the locally available item is. And you saw the few examples that I shared. I hope that gives sort of the picture of the way it works around the world. 
Um, but that's the reality of these different diets and getting the energy adjusted amount of each type of food is crucial to this step because each type of food has its accompanying micronutrients, right? So the, you want the right quantity of say calories of vegetables so that you can get the appropriate mix of fiber, water, and the micronutrients that are in those vegetables. And that's the way you get to nutrient adequacy simply by following the healthy diet basket quantities. Just to give you the flavor of that very quickly, um, the least cost vegetables in the United States in 2017 for ICP data happened to include iceberg lettuce. So in our least cost healthy diet basket for the United States, a third of the fruit and vegetable, a third of the vegetable component, uh, and the vegetable component, remember, is a total of, um, is a total of uh, 110 calories from vegetables. This requires, uh, so getting a third of that from, to include iceberg lettuce means a, I think it's 300 grams of iceberg lettuce, something like that, right? So a huge quantity of iceberg lettuce, like basically a plate, like, you know, a huge fraction. Of now, if you were to have the other vegetables be, you know, avocado, it would be a tiny little piece. Um, but both of those would give roughly, on average, the micronutrient composition that would uh, meet nutrient adequacy um, in terms of vitamins, minerals, and so forth. And that's why we use the energy adjusted. It's not an energy adjusted method in the old sense. It's an energy adjusted method in the sense of trying to extract how much is the right quantity of everything from iceberg lettuce at one extreme, which is of course mostly water, to avocado, which of course has no water in it almost at all. No, it's, it, it, there's a flavor of this coming through in the question. So let me, let me paraphrase it in a different way. We haven't really, I don't think, addressed the issue of consumer sovereignty, consumer's right to choose. And I'm thinking back oh, maybe in the 70s, Eric Thorbeck, talked about what he called an inflection point as household incomes increase just a little bit. This is an inflection point where households demand more variety, more sugars, more fats, more, more animal source foods. And that's a consumer preference. Um, how do we, we, we seem to be saying we wanna shift consumer preference. And I, I'm gonna go in the opposite order. I'm gonna ask Cheryl, Roy and, and Will, and then we're running out of time. But you know, how do you, consumer sovereignty to me seems to be important, Cheryl. How do you put this into your equation of true cost, true, true value. Absolutely, but transparency in the system is so important um, because at the moment there's no grading. So you have a couple of sustainability features, for example, in fisheries, um, but there are not many grading systems out there that inform consumers about the choice. So I deliberately showed the fair choice uh, for the fair oh, trade oh. example, because we think that we're benefiting the farmer by supporting fair trade, but um, the Impact Institute's research shows that no, the middleman is benefiting and consumers are, are really not um, paying for, for the savings that farmers are making. So yeah, we certainly need far more education. There was a question um, in the comment box and I think it's gonna take a huge drive to educate people. I mean, even if I think of our peers in academia who haven't kept pace with the Food Systems Summit, there's a great deal of need to bring them on board to integrate these. So there's a big drive in the world to integrate the sustainable development goals and education. But food systems is the next level of sustainable development goals. And I believe will inform the next um, iteration of whatever those development goals will be post 2030. And so I think we've got a lot of educating to do at all, at all levels. Um, but we talk a lot about mindful eating, more in terms of oh. mindful in terms of nutrition, but the mindful needs to go through the social economics and economic and the nutritional components. Where, where my mind went, Eileen, was uh, around just how much we don't know about our foods in terms of the, the incredible diversity of there and also the food composition. You know, we just did this interesting analysis of you know, what are the foods that feed humanity? And it was a, a long six months progress, global process, came up with 1,700 foods. And it's interesting, the USDA only has food composition for 400 of those. So the majority of foods that actually are, are actually culturally and important haven't even been analyzed. So that's one. 
And then the ones that have analyzed most food composition tables only measure about 150 molecules. Yet we know an average human diet has 20,000 plus. So we are not met, we don't know or understand 99% of the molecules that we are ingesting. Uh, so it's the the level we need to understand. You know, like this, there's this incredible amount of information we still need to um, uh, to, to understand. Um, and 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 it's one of the reasons why I think it's so exciting. You know, to take that diversity in the way Will is doing really helps us understand um, how that translates into uh, affordable diets. Will, you have one minute for you, the last yeah. comment in this session. And, and just to add, this is a great segue to the policy and program session next. Um, you know, I certainly would echo what Roy and Cheryl said about transparency and just beginning to learn what's in our food and beginning to learn how it affects our bodies. These are new compounds that did not exist before as Roy was saying, um, and we need to understand them and trans have transparency. Uh, but you know, when we discovered the safety consequences of other types of sectors, um, we didn't just use tax policy. We didn't just use disclosure. We didn't just use um, uh, you know, safety nets and so forth. That's not how we got to safety vehicles safety in vehicles and travel. That's not how we got to safety in houses that don't burn down. That's not how we got to safety at your hardware store. So your you know, you know, hammer doesn't explode. You, know, you don't put a label on it saying, caution, you know, exploding hammer. Virtually everything in a hardware store is regulated by OSHA. Um, and everything in our grocery store is regulated by FDA for food safety, like pretty well, um, and F regulated for nutrients by FDA and USDA a little bit. Um, but it's very early days. The first big achievement on regulation of nutrition was getting in the United States trans fats out of the food system. Mm -hmm. And I think the frontier really is in that process and product regulation. That's how we got safe, safe cars is not by disclosing about seat belts and you know, that sort of thing. It's just about industry partnerships that set standards for how autos would be built and all of them built the same with the same airbags and the same seat belt construction and the same roll cage and doing year by year improvements in the fleet wide average fuel emissions. That's how we got emissions down year by year improvements in the standards for crash safety. Um, and, and that is what we're just beginning to do for nutrition by regulating the things yeah. starting with trans fats, yeah. but the next to go, you know, are gonna be the big consequences for diabetes heart disease, as Roy mentioned, hypertension and so forth, through regulations that govern the total amount of sodium and the sodium bombs that are some foods, regulating the total you know, refined grains to whole grain ratio um, that's analogous to emissions you know, of cars and that sort of thing, and regulating um, any other compounds that we can begin to uh, alter through process and product standards. It's going to be a because draconian consumer task. sovereignty draconian, is not how we got draconian task. Yeah. But let me just say my final comment on that. It's a sad commentary that Europe was leagues ahead of getting rid of trans fats than was the United States. Um, anyway, there were a number of questions, many that have not been answered. We will follow up where we have contact information and respond to the individual questions that we have not addressed uh, from participants. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Morrison and your session, Jamie, I, I, will, I think we'll address the issue. What, what, what should we do? <laughs> in, indeed. Thank you, Eileen. And, and thanks to all of the panelists in the first session. I think you've given us a, a good deal to build on as we now turn to discuss some of the potential policy and operational implications of using TCA in the design and implementation of government programs. So to start off the session, we'll have a, a keynote presentation by Kathleen Merrigan. Um, Kathleen was formerly Deputy Secretary of Agriculture under President Obama and is now Executive Director of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State University. And we'll then turn to two panelists for a discussion of some of the issues and trade-offs implicit in the use of TCA. Shibani Ghosh, who is Research Associate Professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University, and also Associate Director of the USAID Food Systems Innovation Lab, and Daniel Mason Bacroz, who is Senior Research Associate at Cornell Global Development and a Fellow at the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability. And after the panel discussion, we should again have plenty of time for a question and answer session. Um, 
you know, bringing in, in Kathleen, uh, Shabani and, and Daniel, but also hopefully some of the panelists from, um, from the first session. So I would encourage you all to continue to, to put your um, questions and answers in the Q&A session, in Q &A section, and then we can try to, to address some of those in that. So with these brief introductions, I'd now like to turn the floor to Kathleen Merrigan for her keynote presentation. Kathleen. Hey, thank you, Jamie. And uh, good morning from sunny Arizona. And hello to all my Tufts friends out there. Uh, today, my plan is to cover three topics, if time allows. First, and most importantly, and I guess this goes to the what should we do question that we concluded on in the last panel, I want to provide my thoughts on how to embed true cost accounting into governmental decision making. Second, um, I will engage in a TCA, true cost accounting thought experiment focused on faux meat. And finally, if time allows, I want to provide a glimpse of beef livestock TCA work that's underway at Arizona State University in collaboration with colleagues at Colorado State. By the way, I don't have slides. Will sent us his slides over the weekend, and they were so good, I was intimidated and I threw out my junkie slides. So you just have my face during this presentation. Um, one last introductory thought before I go into the substance of my talk. And this is, uh, I guess it was related to my toss out slides. My title of my talk was gonna be show me the money. And that's because I wanted to emphasize, and I always do when I talk about true cost accounting, that um, this is not about making food more expensive. And to follow on in the great conversations we've been having already this morning, we know that there's so many people in the world who are struggling with food insecurity and that we don't want food to be more expensive. TCA is really about creating a transparency of the full cost of food production to help inform decision makers in the public and the private sectors about the implications of their actions. Now, hopefully once those two costs are visualized, that will change decision making but if it doesn't, that allows the rest of us to hold those decision makers accountable. So show me the money, we want transparency. So on the role of government, I'm gonna kick off this discussion by starting with my bottom line, which is that true cost accounting is not a brand new concept or an approach, but I argue it's uh, evolved modern and hopefully improved variant of cost benefit analysis. I oftentimes just say CBA, what I'm saying is cost benefit analysis. For this reason, I argue that it's important to study cost benefit analysis, understand how governments use cost benefit analysis, you know, over time and glean lessons for our collective TCA work. In other words, let us allow history to be our guide here. Cost-benefit analysis has long been viewed as important to rational decision-making. The basic idea that no action be, can be taken unless the benefits outweigh the costs has deep philosophical roots. And there are probably political scientists among us who could go through all the different philosophers over time. I will not do that to you today. It's been a cornerstone of welfare economics, it's been a mainstay of federal regulatory policymaking, especially starting in the Reagan area, um, excuse me, the Reagan era when it was enshrined into our rulemaking process, um, bringing in so-called ob objectivity into regulatory decision-making. CBA is a widely used technocratic tool that aids decision-making no matter what direction a particular decision might take. It's not favored by Republicans over Democrats, to Democrats over Republicans, the left, the right, the middle. It's a technocratic tool. Now I've spent several years working at USDA and have been in my various roles, deeply engaged in federal government rulemaking. I actually love rulemaking. It's one of the things my friends make fun of me about. You know, from the rulemaking that started the National Organic Food Standards, my first big effort way back in the year 2000, 
to more recent rules regarding food safety, conservation, farm payments. I've overseen countless cost benefit analyses that accompany major US rules. But before diving into the US context, let me assure you that discussing the relationship of TCA to CBA is relevant to many corners of the globe. Cost benefit analysis is embedded in governmental decision making across much of the globe. The science and practice of CBA extends well beyond US borders. For example, in 2014, the European Commission published a how to guide to CBA to appraise investment projects. The Society for Benefit Cost Analysis was formed in 2007 with members um, at the very start from 35 different countries. The society launched the open source journal of benefit cost analysis that's now published by Cambridge University Press and it's international in scope. A 2019 issue, special issue, for example, um, was titled benefit cost analysis in low and medium income countries, methods and case studies. So my point here is that cost benefit analysis has been recognized as a valid tool to advance rational decision making across the globe. So by my estimations, there's more similarity between true cost analysis, true cost accounting, excuse me, and cost benefit analysis than there is difference. Both are methodologies intended to fully describe and make transparent costs and benefits associated with proposed actions, and in doing so, help decision makers understand the implications of contemplated actions. To the extent there are differences, they mainly relate to the scope of the analysis, with TCA these days trying to take a broader scope. So let me repeat myself, let us have history be our guide. If you go through the history of cost benefit analysis literature, uh, commonly three flaws are identified that um, I think those of us who are working on TCA should be alert to and figure out how they may apply to the work they're doing. These flaws uh, from this uh, cost benefit analysis literature weigh very heavily on my mind as I work through my own Global Alliance um, for the future of food supported pr project on TCA of beef livestock production in the Western US. So the first flaw that comes up repeatedly is about knowledge gaps. A CBA is only as good as the data used to produce it. And the kind of hard data needed to produce a successful analysis is oftentimes unavailable or unreliable. One important aspect of this is that Regulated entities are often the primary source for data on potential costs of policy proposals. I mean, going directly to the source is actually a good instinct in many ways, and requesting data from regulated entities is oftentimes the only way to get the, necessarily, in the necessary information you need for your analysis. But it does have potential to have compromised data in the analysis. Regulated entities have an incentive to exaggerate the costs of proposed regulations in order to avoid or soften them. A 2014 uh, study done by a governmental agency here in the US of 203 federal rules emphasized that agency officials found monetizing benefits more difficult than monetizing costs. In particular, they get really stuck on monetizing welfare benefits, such as quality of life, freedom, relationships, and happiness. And because these values are not traded in the marketplace, analysts struggle to give them a price tag within a cost benefit analysis. And Roy earlier um, talked a little bit about this. Um, but absent a benefit attribution, these values become invisible. Part of the challenge about um, cost benefit analysis from the beginning is that there have been strenuous objections of placing a value, particularly a monetary value, on certain things based on ethical or moral grounds. For example, putting a price tag on life. 
or limb. Although our insurance does that, if I lose a hand in construction, there's a insurance value to that. But we 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 don't like that. Um, we don't like monetizing the intrinsic value of a forest. I do agree there are limits. It would be tragic to use cost benefit analysis or uh, true cost accounting to choose between a proposal that allows children to spray pesticides and one that allows children to drive tractors when both are too dangerous for children to undertake. In each case, um, it's just flat out wrong. But beyond some extreme examples, I'm ready to put a price tag on anything. Show me the money. By monetizing, we create visibility. I always think of the example I always share with my students about food waste. And when uh, FAO came out with the report that said if food waste were a country in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, it would be the third largest emitter behind China and the US. And, and that, um, that calculation woke up the world in part to food waste. We need more of that. Among the examples cited in cost-benefit analysis literature of non-traded benefits that go unmeasured is biodiversity, which of course was the concern that led to the launch of TEAB AgriFood supported by the United Nations Environment Program and something I was involved in for many, many years. Um, techniques such as willingness to pay and statistical life calculations are used to approximate hard to measure benefits but few are satisfied by the state of the art, myself included. There's almost universal agreement that measurement of welfare benefits and other non-traded goods is a longstanding and significant weakness of cost benefit analysis. So how are we gonna improve upon this with TCA? Although objections to monetizing non-market benefits like happiness have largely come from liberal critics, the irony the irony could be that finding successful ways to monetize social and human capital, which is a key focus of TCA work, could be what ultimately justifies those stronger government regulations that, that Will is ready to uh, advance. The second thing that comes out of the CBA literature is a concern about overwhelming complexity. I know from my own work that some federal rules are hundreds of pages long without counting the additional pages of accompanying analyses, which include the cost benefit analysis. The complexity of CBAs that accompany significant rules here in the US is often overwhelming. And in many cases that complexity renders the document useless. Many CBAs are left unread by busy policymakers and inaccessible to average citizens. For these reasons, some CBA scholars have urged for greater simplicity in CBAs, brought about by the construction of system boundaries, aggregation techniques, and perhaps most importantly, elimination of the expectation that the cost benefit analysis must be definitive and complete. Reducing the complexity might provide greater clarity and allow citizens to reflect on CBA findings and their comments submitted for consideration in the rulemaking process. Big challenge number three, implementation challenges. So the quality and success of a cost benefit analysis as implemented by the US federal government at least has been compromised in three ways. First, in-depth analysis of externalities takes time and resources. Yet in our system, at least, Congress doesn't appropriate a separate budget to conduct a CBA associated with rulemaking. This leads to agency staff wanting to cut corners and conduct a CBA on the cheap in order to protect programmatic budgets. Secondly, producing a quality cost-benefit analysis requires skills and experience, and not all agencies have economists or otherwise qualified analysts on staff capable of executing a CBA. I've seen some pretty terrible efforts. And third and most significantly is become standard practice. And this may be the most important one. It's become standard practice for program staff to first draft a proposed rule and then pass it on to their colleagues usually the group of economists in the, in the agency, to subsequently develop a corresponding co cost-benefit analysis. 
this linear progression of work reduces the CBA to a paper exercise that's really there to justify the proposal rather than shape it. Rather, ideally, right, cost-benefit analysis, or if we are able to substitute TCA for C CBA, it should be undertaken in parallel with the development of the proposal so that the analysis can inform the rulemaking docket, in our case, that's in progress and allow policymakers to make more informed adjustments along the way. So just thinking about the CBA experience and what we might do with government. Um, first of all, I wanna say true cost accounting is not a radical departure from cost benefit analysis. It's sometimes portrayed as a, you know, the TCA is a brand new thing. I really oppose that. We need to learn from cost benefit analysis, particularly from the flaws, knowledge gaps, complexity, implementation challenges. And we really need to get over our queasiness about assigning dollar values to certain things, which uh, has led to a lot of criticism of CBAs being uh, inadequate. <laughs> We've got to get over it. If TCA designers ignore the lessons of cost benefit analysis shortcomings, there is no reason to believe that true cost accounting will overcome the difficulties of plagued CBA practice. I also want to say, and I heard some of this this morning already, that I think moving the language from true cost accounting to um, true values is a mistake. When I think about values in the political sphere, when I think about talking about values, if I walk into the doors of the US Department of Agriculture or the White House, that already signals a political discussion. And the beauty about accounting, it's a very technocratic, just the facts ma'am approach. Um, there's also a lot in the negotiation literature that negotiating values is about the hardest thing to do. So I really um, implore people to stick with the true cost accounting, uh, green eye shade approach. We're just uncovering the facts that have always been there and bringing them to the attention of decision makers. I think that is a good political strategy. A final thought, if the degree of difference between true cost accounting and cost benefit analysis is exaggerated, it will be difficult politically to substitute true cost accounting for cost benefit analysis. And that's what I hope we are um, on the pathway of doing. Rather than promoting TCA as something brand new, the best course of action is to harness the power of familiarity and argue that TCA is simply an improved form of cost benefit analysis. That, Eileen and friends, is my strategy for wiggling in and getting TCA embedded in governmental decision making. Okay, on to FOMI. I've gone on too long. A few years ago, I wrote a book chapter on TCA as it relates to FOMI. And here I use faux as in faux leather, essentially means substitutes to the real thing. It was published as part of a 2021 volume, True Cost Accounting of Food, Balancing the Scale. Um, this book, by the way, is open access and free to download. I'll try to put the link in the chat momentarily. I recommend it. There are thoughts from more than 40 authors across the globe on a range of TCA topics in this book. Before writing this book chapter, I've been thinking about FOMI for a very long time, back in 2012, I gave a commencement address that I framed around the emergence of cellular meat. For years, I'd been frustrated. People were embracing faux meat without any thought. In some cases, the same people who are pushing back on so-called ultra-processed food, who are consuming nearly all organic food, are now championing faux meat. People who are outraged about pesticides are ignoring the fact that for example, glyphosate may be used to produce that soy burger on the plate. So look, I'm still on the fence on faux meat, whether it's Beyond Meat Burger, the Impossible Burger, or a, a burger that's come from a test tube. I can see positives and negatives, but until we produce a full TCA in these innovations, I'm not ready to stand up and cheer. Comparing real meat with faux meat is complicated. First, the faux meat industry is nascent with much room for innovation. Just in the last couple of years, we've seen so many changes. 
So today's analysis of the subsector may not prove true tomorrow. For example, pea protein costs are high because once the protein is extracted, there is significant unused byproduct, but this could change. Second, the wide range of current livestock practices means there's a corresponding wide range of true costs for the various kinds of operations. For example, we can expect the true costs of rotational grazing beef operation to vary considerably from a confined animal feeding operation. Third, while animal agriculture is not new, it too is innovating. The potential to feed cattle seaweed, to reduce methane emissions and insects, to replace forages grown with pesticides are just two examples under development. Undertaking a full TCA requires transdisciplinary teams tackling time-consuming and complicated research that pairs and analyzes specific faux meat products and production processes to various kinds of meat products and production regimes. This is why TCA is so helpful. I'm going to go through the four capitals and just give a brief insight on what a TCA approach might consider and uncover. So let's look at natural capital, for example. Things to consider. For crops used in plant-based meat, as well as cattle feed, common use of pesticides and nitrogen fertilizers and the resulting pollution must be factored in. Land use is a consideration. 40% of global terrestrial land because of lack of moisture, steepness, and or heat is best suited for animals that convert plant materials indigestible for humans into meat. Come visit me in Arizona, I'll bring you out to the rangelands, you'll see this firsthand. Embedded water needs need to be assigned for each ingredient in faux meat and compared with embedded energy and water in livestock produced in various production systems. On to produce capital. So there's so much excitement now about sequestering carbon as a potential strategy to combat climate change and reward farmers for environmental stewardship. Will test tube meat deliver the same? The production of soil carbon and related financial rewards may variously apply to plant-based and heme-infused faux meat, depending on cropping practices, as well as animals produced in regenerative systems. Faux meats, uh, they, that sell at, right now currently at very high prices on a per pound basis and might be out of reach for many consumers in developed countries and out of sight in developing nations. Energy needs, needs to produce cellular meat are huge right now, coming down, but still huge, well be, beyond any of the other faux meats or beef production. This is even true when considering the embedded energy in feedstuffs for cattle with the typical conversion rate of six pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. Human capital, human factors must be evaluated. Consumption of faux red meat is generally comparable to beef in terms of calories and saturated fat, although it's higher in carbohydrates. Faux meat has significantly higher sodium compared with real meat. Um, you know, we don't have to worry with faux meat about E. coli, I hope or hormone, hormones and antibiotics. I could go on, social capital. There is a possibility that faux meats could enhance food options for certain religious groups, maybe have animal welfare benefits, but governance of faux meat is murky. And as the faux meat industry grows, it's reasonable to expect friction over governance within countries and between countries with potential trade conflict emerging from different approaches to these novel products. So, I need a little water, excuse me. The issues I've raised come from my developed world perspective. And, and I think Eileen was hitting, hinting at this at the end of the last session. A parallel discussion on faux meat is necessary to consider the two thirds of rural households globally, many of them poor and food secure, food insecure, whose well being relies on livestock. Um, it's in conclusion, it's time to apply TCA methodology to faux meat innovations to determine the true costs at a global scale across the four capitals. I have five minutes left, my beef livestock production. So anyhow, I will just say really quickly, we've gone from the thought experiment of faux meat to the real life experiment uh, on ranches in Colorado and Arizona. We're looking at uh, cow-calf uh, cow -calf operations. Um, with a lot of different case studies. Uh, we were really um, set back with COVID and not being able to do field uh, research, but we're soon to release a very exciting report where we're using 
um, LCA plus soil testing plus um, satellite imagery, biomass assessments, um, and uh, a couple of different modeling exercise that embed what we've learned over our, our interviews with uh, farmers and the data that they've provided us to understand the larger Western raging, uh, ranching context. Um, I'm excited about it, and I can't wait to share it with you. So whew, with friends and colleagues, um, my bottom line is that true cost accounting is an underused tool, uh, as we see in the case of faux meat. Uh, government is yet to embrace it, and a lot of us are still doing our research, like we are at ASU, to refine the methodology. It's a work in progress. Um, but but it's important and we have to recognize that along with all the science, there's the political agenda here. We need to figure out how to get policymakers excited about the potential of TCA. And I think that uh, just having this forum uh, with FAO uh, co-sponsoring, I thank you very much, that elevates our work and uh, we're on a road to success, one hopes. Thank you. And um, now I'd like to turn over the podium to my colleague, Shabani Gosh of Tufts University. Thank you, Kathleen. That was excellent. And I think, um, yeah, the point you make about familiarity um, is, is, is really important. I mean, I remember you know, back in the early 90s, the National Resource and Environmental Economics Fraternity um, looking in, in huge de detail about how to extend the cost benefit analysis framework to incorporate um, some of the externalities to inform um, the, the, the use um, of, of natural resources, um, the, the, the speed at which they should be exhausted, the optimal rates of depletion, the, these sort of aspects. So I think yeah, the, 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 the concept or the framework has been used across the, the decades in, in different contexts. And I think now, as you say, um, if we can use that to build on and to introduce true cost accounting, which, which has a different focus, as you said, a different scope, I think you know, that we, we would all benefit from that. And it, it's not a new concept, as you say. So, I mean, we'll have a chance to come back to some of these issues in the, the question and answer. Um, but I'd now like to turn to our two panelists, um, Shabani and Daniel, and, and with them, try to explore some of these issues in the context of, of different um, sort of socioeconomic and geographical contexts. Um, you know, much of the discussion um, so far, and indeed much of the use, the examples of use of TCA and indeed cost benefit analysis has been in the context of more developed countries. So Shabani, um, question to you. What, do you think there is a need to adapt TCA to reflect specific human health concerns of developing countries? Thank you. I just want to make sure I'm not on mute. Okay. So first of all, I want to say thank you, everybody, for inviting me. Um, and Kathleen, I could have let you have my 10 minutes. It's been fascinating listening to your four meet uh, uh, thought experiment. Um, so yeah, and Jamie, to answer your question, yes, absolutely. There is a significant variability that uh, with respect to human health issues, if you are going to be using TCA at a regional or a country level, um, and we're all very familiar with the fact that um, in many uh, parts of the world, there is this sort of rapid transition that is happening with respect to nutrition where uh, and nutritional status where you're shifting from um, communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases being the major public health issue. But we're also still um, in instances where both of them exist at the same time, which if you call it as the dual burden, if you will. Um, so those, those are very sort of context specific externalities that will need to be um, examined um, by the, the, the group or the researcher who are focusing and using TCA in those contexts. Um, this, so in that also context, uh, this has already been highlighted by Cheryl and Will uh, from the perspective of data um, similar to uh, data on food composition or um, 
data on uh, food availability, uh, there is a lot of it, there are a lot of issues with existing data on human health. Um, and so that's something um, to think about um, when you are um, trying to adapt TCA uh, within the context of uh, specific human um, health um, concerns. The last point I want to make is that um, I've been talking to Patrick Webb, who has commissioned some work at the Global Panel um, for Nutrition and Agriculture. Um, and what he pointed out was that there are some distinct differences in hidden costs around human health outcomes. Um, the cost uh, for uh, undernutrition, for example, is not very high in their estimates compared to the cost of NCDs. And that's not necessarily because there is no cost of undernutrition, it's because there, is, uh, there are no preventive actions or there are no, or if there are treatment actions, those are very small and or they're not being tracked. So I just wanna sort of highlight two things in this is that yes, context specific externalities for human health uh, need to be considered. And also the fact that there isn't much data and, and or there isn't uh, a lot of uh, tracking of costs, um, which might lead to estimates that are, uh, are not uh, completely um, uh, reliable. So back over to you, Jamie. Thanks, Shivani. Um, Daniel, if I could turn to you um, on the same set of issues, what are your thoughts with respect to um, to the points that Shabani was made, but, but also you know, perhaps extending that to the climate or environmental concerns. How can TCA be made, made more relevant to decision makers? And how do you see its strengths and weaknesses vis-a-vis -vis other policy tools? Because you know, often, I think as Kathleen was hinting at in her presentation, it's not as if policymakers just use, or they certainly shouldn't be just using one tool um, to inform policy. So, so how, do you, how do you see TCA fitting into the, the overall um, policy information set, if you were? I uh, think I'm now off mute here. Uh, well, there's just so much to digest here. Uh, so it's a little hard to, to zoom in on one thing. Uh, I think the point that Shivani just made in terms of uh, the costing of the health side, I think is one of those that really needs to have some additional consideration in terms of uh, making TCA uh, important, usable in different sort of economic contexts. Uh, I think it's one of those where kind of going back to Kathleen's point that we need to do a better job of, of being able to monetize and value some of these things is important. You know, how do we compare the stunting of human potential that comes from poor diet at the beginning of a person's life versus the exorbitant cost of maintaining quality of life uh, from a chronic disease in a high income setting once you're already you know, in middle age, uh, which in some part comes back, I guess, to thinking about what we care about as well. So I, going to Kathleen's point, of, I, I, I appreciate the importance of keeping true cost is about cost, but I think there might be a necessary discussion where there's two tiers, where there's also a discussion of true values, because ultimately the values will inform what are the costs that we care about. And if we don't have that discussion and only do true cost as a technocratic number crunching exercise, then I would fear that what we'll end up doing is that we'll value the things that are easy to measure versus value the things that maybe are more important. Uh, and I really appreciated Roy's comment earlier on about this idea of being transparent about assumptions and allowing you to sort of change things. And maybe it's not quantitative in the same way of accounting exercise, but it might allow you to sort of weight what are the things that we care more about. Uh, and maybe that would be a valuable piece to do earlier in the decision making process when trying to think about what is acceptable and isn't acceptable, kind of what Kathleen was saying about sort of system boundaries. Um, I think incorporating that uh, sort of mindset would be a valuable thing in, in policy uh, in any context where there's high, low, middle income. Uh, I think one of the things in terms of, uh, and I, I'd be interested to hear what Shivani and others have to say about this, that I think is really hard about operationalizing benefit cost ratios or true cost is that they're static exercises. And all of these processes are highly dynamic any change you make shifts everything around. And we know that data is a challenging aspect to, to get just a snapshot of what things look like, but knowing that technologies are changing, 
what the environmental health, social, economic impacts of production and consumption are, uh, and, and thinking about how true cost could incentivize different types of actions that will then have repercussions and, and having institutions that are sufficiently flexible to, to sort of move with a constantly changing system, I think is, is something that I find, I don't have a good answer for. I, I think others here probably are, are wiser than me and may have some ideas um, on how we can sort of create more robust institutions that can, can move uh, you know, flexibly with, with changing situation. Um, so I don't know if I fully answered the question that you gave me, Jamie, but those were at least some of the things that came to mind um, as, as I've been listening to everyone's presentations. No, great. Thanks, Daniel. And um, I think the, the issue you raise about the dynamic nature of, of food system transformation is, is really important and one that we'll, we should come back to and dig a little bit deeper um, uh, a bit later in this discussion. Uh, it, it relates very closely to the, the process of the Food System Summit and, and, and what we're looking to do to follow up to the Food System Summit, how, how to advise governments in taking forward their pathways, for example. But let, let's come back to that particular point because I think it's, yeah, and again, there are lessons, um, as I'm sure Kathleen will be able to elaborate from, from the use of, of cost-benefit analysis on, on how the sort of, um, the time dimension can be brought into play um, in, in informing policy. But just perhaps before turning to that issue, um, one, one of the other aspects I think which came through in the earlier um, session is that in many low and middle income countries, um, the subsidization of, of staple crops is still seen as, as being somewhat of a necessity, whether it be for political or for, and or for food security reasons. So, I mean, Shabani, what do you see as some of the, the food security trade-offs involved in these decisions? And, and how do you think that TCA could be used to help assess the true cost of staple commodities? Um, and, and do you think that this will have much traction with policymakers in that context? Yeah, I think this is a, yeah, I'm not the person to speak of trade-offs, though I was the one who highlighted this as an important issue um, because working on the ground, you do find that decisions that policymakers are making are very short term. And, and so I think it's something that Kathleen highlighted is like, how do we embed TCA into the decision making into the system so that it's not considered as a shock by policymakers um, when, uh, when, when it really uh, is being presented. So I think the idea is that I, I would want to make sure that besides the contextualization of the TCA approach to the region or the country that one is going to be focusing on, we need to have an understanding of the nuances of that specific food system. And so that when you're presenting the findings of the TCA, if it's by a specific food commodity like a staple, I think there need to be alternatives on the table so that you're not just presenting that this is a particular this is a particular commodity and we need to, to shift the thinking around, um, around how, what the true cost of this commodity is and therefore the regulations that are needed around this commodity because that may not necessarily gain traction. But I think Will has sort of um, highlighted the importance of looking at true cost of a healthy diet and sort of looking at it from the perspective of not just specific commodities, but looking at it from a basket of commodities might also uh, provide um, uh, provide traction. The key thing I also want to emphasize is it's not just about presenting what the true cost is or the true cost accounting, but what are the solutions at hand? So if it is a staple commodity that is of critical uh, is critical for a country, um, it's wheat or maize or rice or any other you know crops. Then if 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 it is that the true cost needs to be adjusted, what are the solutions? that are going to be available for that policymaker because uh, Kathleen said, show me, the, show me the money. I think policymakers will also say, okay, this is a problem, but what's the solution to this problem? So I, I don't have a, like a much more expansive answer to this. There might be others, uh, other colleagues here who might be able to speak more at this, but I think that this is a critical issue to keep in mind when thinking about using TCA um, uh, with respect to commodities, staple commodities in low and middle income countries. 
Great, thanks, thanks, Shivani. Um, Daniel, bu building on on the points that Shivani made, and um, given that we are, as we heard in the earlier session, we're still struggling somewhat to achieve nutrient ad adequacy, particularly micronutrient adequacy in diets. It, are there any risks in promoting um, TCA, or will highlighting the true cost of, of subsidized commodities help to provide the required evidence for policy change in a, in a better direction? Always challenging to speak, I guess, in generalities, because the answer to that question uh, vary dramatically from one location to another. Um, however, I think if policymakers were to think of TCA as a framework of how to think of the various costs and benefits that can accrue from different actions, then I think, you know, whether or not the cost of uh, subsidizing maize in one country would be the same in another is somewhat uh, a different question than whether or not TCA can provide a useful framework to trying to think about the pros and cons of any intervention. Uh, and so in that respect, I think it could be very helpful in terms of thinking about uh, in any sort of resource scarce setting, is this the best use of scarce public resources to subsidize this versus subsidize something else? You can think about what the costs and benefits are. I think Shabani's point about not focusing so much on single commodities, I think is key because I think it's really necessary to think about it more holistically um, because even, even the inputs into TCA, if you look at it one piece at a time and you can miss the big picture. So, you know, Kathleen's point of like faux meat, you know, one of the, the things that people often say is a benefit is that it reduces water. Well, maybe, but most of the water that's used to produce beef is actually for producing feed. And if you remove cattle from the scenario, are you not watering crops anymore? You may just be watering crops for some other end and you haven't reduced water usage, it's just being used for something else. Uh, so it's, you know, if, if you zoom in too much, I think you miss the forest for the trees. And so I think TCA is a really valuable tool to sort of think about a little bit more big picture and, and think some of those pros and cons. And then it allows you to sort of, I think, prioritize how to use scarce resources. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there and, and let others speak. Great. Shivani, any, any thoughts on that? Um, yes, I think this was one, one of the things that came to my mind when I was reading up about TCA. I said, what would be the repercussions of TCA at the policy level, especially when we're dealing with countries uh -huh. that have are still trying to achieve nutrient advocacy? And I think a lot of the questions that came to my mind were what Will and, and, and Cheryl were also sort of thinking about and presented in the first uh, session. Um, but I, I think I do come back to the fact that, you know, even if you do present a basket of foods, I think highlighting um, and ensuring that policymakers understand that nutrient dense foods, no matter how intensive or higher their cost is likely to be, their true cost, they are critical for a healthy diet. That would be the one thing that needs to be up front and center. Uh, because you don't want to have a situation where decisions are being made in a basket over foods that are not nutrient equivalent, if you will, that would be the term I would use. Um, so that's really, really critical. And I think that's where the animal source food discussion goes. And I wanted to make some a little point on the animal source foods. They are required in very small, from a nutritionist perspective, they're required in very small amounts and they're required by a very specific target group in, in the population, which is the very young or the very old. So if you, I, I work with the very young, so I would say, you know, you really should think about the fact that, you know, the, the rest of us can eat a lot less beef and or any other animal source food that we choose, but we do really need to think about the most vulnerable in, in, in the world, which are the very young. Um, that's one thing. The second thing I'd like to sort of say is that the nutrient dense foods are inherently going to be more expensive because of the intensity of production. So fruits and vegetables are going to almost always use more water for production than rain fed sorghum. So how do you make those discounts? And I'm looking at Will because I'm sure he has an answer for this. Uh, but it's important that when we are presenting this as a, as, as a sort of presenting this to a policymaker that these things are all accounted for because 
because the decisions that are going to be made are going to be based on what we're going to be able to tell them. So maybe highlighting the efficiency in production or highlighting innovations in the form of technologies, practices or processes, those, those are the kind of things that need to be at the table when, when we are discussing um, TCA of uh, staple commodities versus nutrient dense foods or a, or a basket. So that, though, that, that would be where I would come from on this, Jamie. Okay, thanks, Shivani. Just one of the other um, questions I had to, to both of you. Um, I think Will made a very important point in, in the first session that if, if I understood it correctly, that taking a true cost approach doesn't necessarily imply um, higher consumer prices, higher consumer feed prices. Yeah, the, the, if, if, if the approach can be used to um, push towards production methods, you know, cost of preparation, et cetera, which are um, you know, more sustainable, for example, it may be they also have sort of lower, lower involved costs. Um, but given that there are, you know, particularly from a political point of view, there are clearly sensitivities about um, any perception that a policy may increase the price of food, um, particularly when in many parts of the, of the world at the moment we have this so-called cost of living um, crisis. Um, I, I, I wonder, you know, how far can we take this debate with, with policymakers in the current context of historically high um, food prices and the inflationary pressures that are continuing to squeeze household budgets, not, not just in developing countries, but in all countries globally. So any, any thoughts on that? Perhaps Shivani first and then Daniel? Um, sure, yeah, I think, yeah, I was thinking about this and you know, politics and policy are very interconnected as we all know. And um, so from, from where I was sitting, I was thinking really, there needs to be a clear long-term strategy on how TCA is used, particularly, you know, within the context of uh, developing economies and in sort of low and middle income countries. Um, and, and TCA is a tool that should really affect change. And that change is gonna take a little bit of time. And, and so it's not gonna be something that's gonna happen overnight. Um, one example that comes to my mind that has been used by the nutrition community is the sort of Lancet series on, on um, undernutrition where they really, they, they converted undernutrition. Also they, I would say, I would use Kathleen's term and say monetized what the cost of not dealing with undernutrition uh, would lead to uh, in terms of loss of dailies and productivity and the cost to the economy. That was a process that was over a five to six year period that was undertaken by the, a group within the community. And actually they generated the evidence, they generated the estimates, they published the papers, but they also had UN agencies and even the World Bank's supporting on, on sort of communicating and disseminating those findings to policy audiences. And that has galvanized support for, the, for maternal and infant nutrition interventions. Um, that might be one of the sort of taking a more systematic long-term approach of generating TCA estimates and using them um, towards effecting policy change, which is not necessarily going to be one country at a time, but sort of across uh, the countries, and I'm going to refer to the, the countries that I work with, which is low and middle income countries or countries in the global south. So that would be, um, that would be where I would go. The key point, again, is you come back to the point that everybody has made is the data gaps and the assumptions that are, are made in coming up with those TCA estimates. But I think there is, the, the, on this panel and in the previous panel, there are, there are uh, there's a ton of expertise on how TCA can be applied and the assumptions, ensure that the assumptions are valid and, and, and lead us to reliable um, estimates. So, so that, that would be what I would think would be a way forward um, in gaining traction. Daniel, any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I think the, the question about prices is a, is a challenging one. Um, because I think, as Will pointed out earlier, that it is there are uh, changes in diets that you could do that would not increase prices. But one could also imagine that if everyone switched to that tomorrow, there wouldn't be enough production to satisfy that. And so 
then if that if in that hypothetical, then the prices would radically change and you probably would no longer have a cheaper diet. Uh, so you would need to think of what are the types of investments you need to do today to sort of encourage changes and rebalancing of the food system. And some of this is positive investing and some of this would be removing subsidies to things that shouldn't be supported to move you in the direction of a more sustainable and healthy food system. Uh, I think a potentially galvanizing thought exercise around this is thinking around, you know, very Popkins nutrition transition. Every developing country, low middle income country, they can look to what the impacts of a Western diet are. So they know what the negative consequences are down the line if they don't start trying to find ways to leapfrog the nutrition transition and avoid some of the pitfalls that uh, higher income countries are dealing with now. Uh, and so that might be something that can give you sort of a, a reason to make changes uh, because you already see what the consequences of shifting towards a Western diet will be in the long run. Um, but that kind of comes back to the politics question of short-term versus long-term goals. And, you know, there are many examples of the challenges of balancing these things. Climate change is a great example. Everyone, or at least most people recognize the long-term challenges that climate change presents, but making the immediate changes today to shift away from that is, is politically difficult because you end up having uh, concentrated costs on particular groups that often have powerful um, influence on policy today. And so I think it's a bit of a challenge of how do you galvanize sufficient collective action to make some of these changes. Um, I think it helps to have some of the big picture that you can show these are the benefits and the costs that will accrue if we don't make the shifts. But uh, I don't think it makes the politics in the today uh, necessarily easier knowing that that's where things are in tomorrow. Great, thanks. And that, that's a nice segue into the, the final question that, that I have for the two of you. Uh, and then after, after you've answered that, I'd like to turn to Kathleen for any reactions that, that you have on, on what you've heard from Shivani and, um, and from Daniel. So the, the, the sort of last, last question or set of questions relates back to this dynamic nature of, of food system transformation and how we, we tackle that within a, a true cost accounting um, framework. Now, in the process towards the Food Systems Summit, over 110 countries submitted so-called pathways towards more sustainable food systems. And in those pathways, many countries articulated the outcomes that they would like to achieve. Um, they put forward some of the existing and, and perhaps required programs for achieving those outcomes. But what they haven't really done is to, to necessarily think through what outcomes need to be prioritized in the short term and what perhaps can be pushed a little bit harder in, in the medium to longer term. So Daniel, when, I mean, you, you've hinted at this already, but when thinking about the trade-offs and repercussions of interventions and changes in food systems, what do you see as the potential difficulties in comparing objectives and consequences which have different timescales? And how might, might we need to adapt um, the true cost accounting to help policymakers to compare those costs across different time horizons. Yeah, that's, I think that's one of the key challenges in terms of comparing some of the costs within true cost, um, because there's path dependencies on policies that we can do. And so if we decide to push off doing anything around greenhouse gas emissions, by the time we get around to it, it may be too late, right? And how do you how do you incorporate that into the cost that if you don't do something now, you may not be able to do something about it later, or that the cost of doing that is exponential? Um, I think you know that's a general problem in terms of putting anything into net present value, which is I think one of the things that you would end up doing with true cost. Um, but it, it it is I think a a, a real struggle to be able to get that um, incorporate. I think there's also factors into how do you handle things with like costing risk uh, and things like, you know, the importance of diversity within a diet, but also within the agro food system. Um, those are things that are, are, are fundamentally about uncertainty 
um, that I think are a little bit difficult for us to incorporate into any framework. This isn't a criticism of true cost. It's just generally, it's hard to do these things. Um, and so I think that that would be, um, I think things that we need to find ways of incorporating um, into the discussion so that it's not just a number crunching exercise, but it's a framework of questioning and thinking. Um, and I think if, if we achieve that, then true cost could be a really great tool for policymaking. But if it becomes just counting numbers in an Excel sheet, um, then I think it would still be an improvement over, you know, just a, because uh, there's more things that are getting looked at, but uh, it, 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 the potential of its impact is, is reduced. Shivani, any, any? Sure, yes. On that one? Yes, and I think, uh, I think uh, Daniel sort of pinpointed on what I was thinking about was that a framework that is needed and keeping in mind that, yes, there are going to be some assumptions that are going to be made and that what is computed in real time now might not be relevant down the path. And I think maybe some of those, some understanding of um, time variance and invariance might be necessary when the researchers are doing those computations. And I'm sure folks like Daniel and Will are already thinking about those things. Um, I also think that one of the things that I wanted to highlight was, uh, again, this was is stuff that the global panel is doing is that what might be uh, the estimate of hidden costs today might, might be different tomorrow. So it's very critical, for example, to highlight the fact that right now um, subsidies are, are a very small portion of the hidden cost for most of the African countries because of the fact that in general, the amount of money that is spent on used on subsidies in Africa is much, much smaller than even what a European country like Switzerland uses. Um, and so, but that does not make that cost less relevant in TCA. And so, so but what that, translates into is that the actual estimate isn't going to be that different from if you didn't include the subsidies in, in your estimation. So the reason I'm saying this is I think to Daniel's point that if there is a framework or a methodology that is created that then allows um, with the understanding that a data um, needs to be available, b there is dynamic shifts in, um, in all these different um, metrics or indicators that are used for the computation um, and that there is needs to be resource availability for TCA, the TCA tool, if I were to call it, to be updated on a, on a periodic basis. And what that period of uh, time would be is not is beyond my expertise, but that might be that might be a way to handle the the uh, the issue of uh, the dynamic nature of our system. Great. No, thanks very much for, for those insights. And thank you to, to both panelists um, for addressing the, the, that set of questions. So before we open up um, to the wider audience, and we do have a few questions in the Q&A section, I'd like to, to just turn to you, Kathleen, if that's OK, for any reflections that you've had on, on what you heard from Shivani and Daniel. Yeah, thanks so much, Jamie. And um, I, sorry, I, I rushed through my last part of my presentation. I, misread the clock, but I was really glad because I thought um, the interventions by Shivani and Daniel were really very valuable. I've got five points I'd like to make from what I heard. Um, first, when we were talking about the global serial dependency and, you know, the risks if things shift, I just want to say that transparency is the first step. I always say to my staff, if you don't apply for the grant, let me assure you, you're never gonna get the grant, right? So relating that to TCA, if you don't show what's going on in the globe around food, nothing's gonna happen about those concerns. Maybe if we show, you know, show the money, show what's happening, change what happened as rapidly as we'd like, or maybe it doesn't happen, but it's an important first step getting that transparency. And this is what this is all about. Um, second, I saw a note in the chat about other measuring efforts, uh, in particular the UN environmental uh, accounting that goes on. Yes, so one of my favorite books ever, uh, it's outdated now, but was Thinking in Time by Newstat and May. And they say essentially there's hardly a policy idea that we can think about that hasn't already been tried and that we need to learn from the history of ideas. 
which is the whole point of my CBA analysis, right? So there were a lot of accounting processes out there. I was uh, reviewing an article recently for a publication and they used an LCA tool that I was unfamiliar with. I sent it to a friend in Belgium and she sent me back a note saying, I'm using this one that everyone uses in uh, France, but here's a chart of all these different LCA frameworks and how they, uh, uh, you know, how they map upon each other. And there were so many I didn't know about. So yes, there, there are things to build upon and to draw similarities and to learn from. And I think that's really important. Values, that's my third point. Um, I think values will come in when we determine ultimately the appropriate scope of TCA, what's included. If it's too deep, it's not useful. That's that whole point that we've learned from cost benefit analysis. If you give a policymaker a big thick uh, document about costs and benefits, it's gonna be left unread. You know, I teach my students, if you're sending a memo to a member of Congress, it better be two pages. If it's going to the president, it can't be over one page. So how do we convey the important things, but not get, you know, bogged down by complexity? Four, cheap food. Um, you know, <laughs> cheap food is really expensive food, right? And I think everyone on this seminar understands that. Um, government policies have preference certain kinds of production and certain foods. And TCA can help put a spotlight on this and create a mandate for policy shifts and investments that make good food affordable for all. So I don't get panicked in this work that we're doing about increasing the price of food. Again, it's about causing um, people in power to do the right thing. And finally, um, Jamie, you raised the country efforts at the Food System Summit, which of course I participated in and watched quite carefully. And I was, I have to say, a little distraught that my own country was pushing the Coalition on Sustainable Productivity Growth, specifically, as our secretary said, as a counter to the European farm to fork strategy, which I think is visionary and is going forward in a future that we all know we need to embrace in terms of reduced pesticides, fertilizers, uh, food waste, more organic production, et cetera. TCA um, is, is the way that we can help show we already have enough food. We know that, and yet we have 800 million people plus who are hungry. We need to have that transparency about the role of food waste, about what, me, what it means to empower women farmers across the globe, uh, about corruption and inequalities. That's, that's the task at hand. Thanks. No, I thank, thank you. I think it's a great way also of, of summarizing some of the, the points that were made in the discussion. Um, so in the time that we have left, we have about 10, 15 minutes um, left. We do have a few questions in the, the questions and answers. And I, as well as our um, panelists for this session, if Will, um, Cheryl, I think Roy's dropped off now, but and Aileen as well, if, if you, want to come in and, and address any of these questions, please do so because some, um, yeah, you, you may be more expert uh, than some of us on the panel on, on specific ones. But I think, yeah, one of the first questions um, that we have, um, Shivani, is probably you'd be best placed to answer it. And it, it relates to food safety. Um, it's quite a long comment, so I'm not gonna try to read it out, but maybe to try to paraphrase. Um, but in, in the discussion, there's, there's been the mention of, of substances which are new to our diets and could be responsible for adverse health effects. And this is from Marcus Lipp from, from FAO. And while he assumes that this doesn't refer to the presence of excessive amounts of regulated substances, um, including residues of antibiotics, it does leave the assumption that um, the presence of regulated substances um, could infer that current risk assessments are uh, insufficient. Um, I'm not sure if that paraphrasing helps, Shivani, but any any thoughts on that and whether, yeah, we're we're sort of in, in pushing the true cost accounting um, 
approach, we're not taking into account the work which is already done by food safety agencies, for example, in, in ensuring that certain substances are not um, are not over over consumed. Unmuting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think this might have come up in a previous the previous session because maybe Will you had something that highlighted the fact that we needed to look at contamination, both biological and non biological. Um, and maybe, um, Jamie, this might be something I'm looking at the comment, I think it's from someone at FAO called Marcus Lip. Um, yes and no, I think in, in the, if I'm looking at it from the perspective of some of the countries I've worked in, in theory, yes, it, on paper, there might be regulatory standards on certain substances, whether biological or non-biological contaminants, chemical contaminants, but often what happens is that the application of the regulation may not be uh, rigorous. And I'll give an example of Bangladesh um, where um, perishable, the, in, in, perishable food items like fish and seafood, which is a huge part of the diet in Bangladesh, um, the issue of having a la no market infrastructure leads uh, farmer, fish farmers, if they're producing the fish or um, uh, fishing populations to, to spray formaldehyde on the fish so they can keep it fresh longer because they don't have the cold chain. Now, is formaldehyde a regulated substance with respect to food? Yes, obviously it's not meant to be in there, um, but it's there. So there isn't a, a system that allows um, the, uh, the consumer to sort of understand what really is safe and what is unsafe. So I don't know if that answers the question. Critical to point out that often there might be regulations, there might be standards, there might be guidance, but it may not be uh, applied rigorously. Will, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this. Sorry, Jamie, I just... No, please do, That's, that was the, the idea. <laughs> No, I think you responded to Marcus Lipp's uh, comments very well. And um, the key question is, you know, as these global standards evolve and improve, the guidance and the guidelines from FAO, WFP, you know, as those get adopted by national governments, what is the mix of instruments that can reflect these true costs where cheap food is expensive, as Kathleen was saying, um, and then adopt the appropriate mix of instruments? Sorry, I was just trying to, to thank you, Will. I was just trying to, to read another question that's come in on the, the same sort of topics. There are also likely to be yet discovered nutrients that have a positive health outcome um, and nutrient, nutrient interactions that impact health. Um, how can we legislate the pros and cons of individual foods uh, when we still don't know enough about them? Yeah, this, this is a critical issue, and I'm going to give a little bit of an example of, you know, um, uh, undernutrition and sort of the key new micronutrients that are the focus, um, which is vitamin A, iron, zinc, um, and iodine. These are like the sort of top four um, nutrients that people focus on because those are the most common in terms of deficiencies. Um, and somebody made a very good point, either it was, whether it was in a class or a seminar I was in that, well, there are all these other micronutrients, particularly the B vitamins that are also critical and we don't actually enumerate them. So we don't, and, and not on a regular basis, if they, even if they are enumerated. So we don't know what the true, um, uh, true deficiency of these, uh, these vitamins is. Um, so yes, there's always going to be that sort of, there's going to have to be a decision on what are the public health priorities. And this is what the nutrition community came up with, that these are the four big micronutrients that need to be addressed. Um, and, and so I think, again, there's going to be some level of prioritization that's going to be needed with, with the nutrients and then sort of nutrient dense foods within the TCA um, that, that may or may not be the right way to go, but I think some decision making is going to have to happen. Um, sorry if I'm being on the fence about this because I, I I don't know which one way or the other to go on this. I'll just jump in here and say yeah, that um, yes. you know having one foot or my side hustle as a professor is venture capital work and ag tech, 
And so I am getting hit all the time with slide decks from startups and there's all kinds of innovations out there. Some that I immediately say yes to the dress and others that scare the bejesus out of me. So I do think we are at a point in the trajectory of food where we may see a lot of new things coming forward. I focused um, in my thought experiment on faux meat. Well, we know that there are alternative beverages to dairy milk. There's, I went to the Natural Foods Products Expo in Anaheim a few weeks ago. There were probably 60,000 people there. I don't know how many different startups, uh, all kinds of imaginative food. So, uh, <laughs> We're talking about TCA and some basic things, rice, beef, you know, and, and uh, they're, they're, we're about to open the door and see all kinds of things. But rather than being um, scared off, I think it makes uh, an even stronger case for the need for true cost accounting as these new entries are coming into the food system. Could I uh, add to that? Um, <clears throat> I think for me, regulating individual foods is a space that I think has a lot of potential risk of starting to put in a lot of rules that become difficult to manage. I think it would be better to start off with the system boundaries. What are things that are acceptable and unacceptable? And if there are categories of food that are, are should not be produced, and I think you know there's growing evidence that sort of ultra processed foods through the way that they're produced have very little, if any nutritional and health benefits, then it might be a thing of like removing uh, those from the choice hierarchy of what we consume. Because if, if our food system requires smart consumers to consume healthy, sustainable diets, then our food system is failing. A safe, sustainable and healthy diet needs to be a default. And if it's not, then we probably won't ever achieve that. If people have to choose it, then, you know, actually consciously think about making those choices with every purchase, then it probably will never happen, just because it will be too much time, too much effort to do that. Uh, I think where we can do more incentives and things like that is looking where are areas of key need in terms of what are we underproducing, what are we overproducing, and then trying to create incentives to shift uh, and rebalance the food system towards that. Not necessarily specific to individual foods, but it might be more like food groups. Maybe we need more focus on fruits and vegetables and legumes because those are underconsumed everywhere. Maybe we need to be looking for ways to disincentivize processed flours so that people consume more whole grains. Um, and not, not necessarily looking at individual um, items per se and trying to be more, I guess, a little bit more generic on, on how we try to incentivize and let then people's innovation um, try to find ways to meet the overall goals without trying to tell people how to achieve those goals. Great, no, thanks, Daniel. Um, and to all of you for, for your insights on that question. But an another, um, Question coming from a different angle, and again um, from a colleague at FAO, um, Ada. And I, I hope I'm interpreting this correctly. It's it's often a bit difficult using the, the Q and A to, to see exactly what the question's asking. Um, but I think this this looks to um, this whole issue of repurposing agricultural support, and what can a true cost accounting approach um, provide by way of insights? Um, in encouraging policymakers to look at current systems of agricultural support and, and maybe um, modify them towards support, which is is hopefully going to, to take us to a better situation. And I see Cheryl, you have your hand for this one. Thank you. Thank you, a tricky one. <laughs> but I think part of the answer lies in the fact that many of these transitions will actually cost quite considerable amounts in the beginning. So there will be a massive investment needed if you are actually going to incentivize a long-term shift. It's much like, for example, the investment in solar energy um, is a big investment up front with long-term benefits. And I think there are many opportunities 
um, on the subsidies part uh, to use them strategically for a period in order to help get over that bump. And in particularly in developing countries, it's going to cost a significant amount to actually move food systems along. So the kind of initial transition that is needed in food systems is going to be considerable. Um, so I think, yeah, they could play a very important role, um, but we have to look very carefully at the unintended consequences. Um, if I can give you a quick example of the whole grains, um, in South Africa in the apartheid era in 1974, there was, a, the, as you know, the food price crisis. Government decided to subsidize brown bread more than white bread in order to incentivize the purchase of brown bread. And that had a completely opposite effect. So people then aspired to white bread because it was seen as the, as the, the food of the wealthy. So yeah, some, we have to look very carefully and do our homework to actually see, uh, will people really respond in the way that we want them to, or could it backfire and actually lead us into a more slippery downward path? Thanks, Jamie. No, thanks, Cheryl. I think that's a really important um, Point. I mean, I've seen examples around the world in relation to um, the taxation of sh sugars and salts, which, which have th exactly these types of unexpected, certainly unintended impacts in terms of, of consumer behaviour. So, yeah, very important to look at the, the more systemic um, impacts of, of these interventions. Uh, Shivani. Yeah, so I think Cheryl's point really highlights the, po uh, the fact that this is not something that is going to change overnight. So significant investment is going to be needed. And that when you are working in the context of um, developing economies, those, those are decisions that policymakers are not willing to make very quickly. And so, you know, in, in light of Kathleen's point about making sure that TCA is an approach that gets institutionalized because we we want transparency. I think there's going to be a little bit more of a process needed um, to bring TCA to the policymakers, especially in those countries that I have experienced and I work in. And, and keeping in mind that this is going to be a little bit of a long haul, but keeping on in a systematic way, uh, addressing the issue uh, at hand is going to be very, very important. What, what I can tell you at this moment from my experience is that shifting policymakers in many of these countries to move resources that they barely have control over and or barely have is going to be is difficult so how do you utilize um, a very very rigorous approach that has huge potential to drive change is is the challenge ahead of all of us no, exactly thanks to uh, daniel yeah, I think that actually made me think of one thing that I, I hope this community is careful with is maybe overselling TCA approaches in terms of, you know, that these are ways of making changes that will be costless uh, or that everything is a win-win. And I think that is potentially dangerous. I'm not suggesting anyone's doing that here, but the way that often these things are framed is look, we can get this and get this, and there's nothing that it costs, right? And I'm, I think that a better approach is thinking about, this is a really great way of identifying the benefits and what the cost might be so that we could decide if it's worth doing. And so there might be times where there's synergies that we get benefits on multiple fronts. And then that means that the benefit definitely is likely increasingly going to outweigh than the cost. But sometimes, the cost is gonna go up. And you know what, that is also okay if what we're getting for it, we believe is worthwhile. Um, and so it's one of those where maybe that feeds a little bit into a somewhat separate discussion uh, that's you know, parallel to the TCA. But it, I think it's one where it, it's important not um, to, to recognize that some of these things are important and they're worth paying a little bit more for it. And you know that's okay. If we can come to an agreement to do that, then that's, that I think is also a successful uh, application of this approach, even if the cost might go up. No, thanks, Daniel. I think excellent point um, to bring. So just we just have time for um, a couple of um, quick questions and answers. Um, Hugh Joseph has, has asked 
or, or made the point that people choose foods for a variety of cultural, religious, social, sensory reason, reasons. Um, how can we incorporate these into a CBA or, or TCA um, approach? Um, and then given that you're all academics, um, we have a question from Anne Schwartz, which says, yeah, how can we bring this conversation to more universities so, so that students look beyond cost benefit analysis and move towards TCA research? So any, any quick reflections that any of you have on either of those questions? Well, to Anne's point, I think we need to infiltrate the econ departments. I remember when um, I was applying to be a professor at Tufts University, and uh, I was asked by B. Rogers, who's on our seminar, what my goal was. I said, I want to be the future professor. I mean, I would be the former professor of a future secretary of agriculture. Um, uh, they liked that answer. They hired me. Uh, but, but part of it, what I was saying is most of ag policy, at least in the United States, has been historically come out of ag econ. And so the power that goes on in economics departments and the training that they're providing students is really important. And we need to get TCA embedded in, um, uh, in the minds of those faculty who are producing the next generation of leaders. Thanks, Kathleen. Other thoughts? One of the major challenges is the blinkered approach and siloed approach of most training programs. Um, so, I mean, I train many ag economists from across Africa who have never heard of Amartasen because that's economics. So <laughs> they have no idea of wealthy or poverty economics. Um, and yeah, the cross fertilization is really important. So one of the ways of doing it is perhaps creating research groups where you have people from different departments working um, on the same graduate project so that students can can um, think together and learn from each other um, because part of the challenge is that it is more advanced training. Um, you need a solid foundation in your undergraduate program in order to engage with these kind of things. But we also need to be teaching the flexibility um, to keep up with what's happening, um, that what you leave graduate school with is not the finite information, it's only the start of the learning journey. So, yeah, perhaps uh, programs of internships with corporates who are going to be looking for this kind of work um, is one way in which we could get real, real life projects going. Where, where students are working on something that is desperately needed, either in the public or the private sector. Mm. Excellent, nice, nice point, Cheryl, thank you. Okay, if I, I think, I, yes, If please. I could just say to Hugh, Hugh's, I don't want Hugh's question to go unanswered. So in the faux meat uh, case, Hugh, it's really interesting because uh, you know with um, kosher and halal requirements in terms of slaughtering of the animal and how that relates to uh, what you can and cannot eat um, for your religious adherence um, rules. You know, uh, faux meat may open the door. It may be all of a sudden that you will have kosher pork, right? Some rabbis are saying so. So it, it is really, again, a new era in food in a lot of different ways. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I think we'll bring this, oh, sorry, Daniel, one last, one last comment to you and then we'll bring this session to yeah. I, I would, I'd build on the cultural thing as well. I think, uh, you know, all these innovations create all sorts of new trade-offs as well, because if there are health, negative health consequences of eating lots amounts of red meat, if you could produce now faux red meat that has all the same characteristics, now what might've been a healthier diet prior, might get worse. Um, so it's things that you would wanna think about on trade-offs. And I think when we think about prices, the limitation of TCA approaches, it might be worth also thinking that prices themselves are cultural constructs. And so how you interpret a price is in part from, you know, the so social and cultural context within which you're in. So, you know, a cheap lobster you might see as not something you want to eat because you think it's dodgy because you think of lobster as being a high quality food, a little bit sort of like example that Cheryl made earlier. And we might have the same issue with healthy foods where we associate healthy 
outcomes with something being a premium product. And so there might be a whole sort of education around that. Um, but there's also an assumption that high prices for food is bad. Maybe, maybe we need to value food and accept that it should be more expensive than it is today. Um, you know, if we rewarded producers of food with higher prices, um, we might be able to resolve other issues like rural urban divides. Uh, it might help reduce waste. Cheap food does not have much incentive to not waste it. Um, at the end of the day, if it's really cheap, you just don't value it the same way. So there's some sort of embedded assumptions with the way we approach this that might also need to be thought about as we move forward. Yeah, I, I think exactly. And I think yeah, articulating this sort of narrative um, with, with those who are making decisions that the policymakers um, will be key, I think, in, in taking the approach forward. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you who've been involved in, in this second session um, of the webinar to Kathleen, to, to Daniel, to Shivani for your insights, um, but also thank you to Will and, and Cheryl for joining the discussion to, to, um, to address some of the questions that were raised. And I think at, at this stage, we'll, we'll move towards closure of the, the webinar as, as a whole. So I'd just like to start um, by thanking on behalf of, of the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, all of the participants, all of the panelists, of course, and the, the great work that you've been doing, um, much of it in association with FAO, which is, is, um, has been very valuable for us as well. Um, and you know, also, I think, very encouraged by the discussions during the past three hours. I think you know, there's a lot of interest in this concept, um, a lot that we can learn from. Um, a lot of challenges, particularly in, in interfacing with policymakers and, and, and making the, the information more digestible and more understandable. Um, and I'd also you know, like to thank, before turning the floor to her, um, Eileen Kennedy, who's really been the driving force behind um, getting this webinar together and, and the, the relationship that we've had um, between Tufts and FAO in, in putting the webinar on. So, over to you for closing words. Jamie, you're being modest in your contribution. This wouldn't have happened without you, so thank you. I also want to add my thanks to the um, speakers and uh, discussants and all the participants. Terrific uh, presentations, terrific set of questions. Um, I know on the agenda it says, I'm looking at summary and conclusions, but I couldn't possibly summarize the, the rich discussions that have taken place in dialogue. So I, I jotted down some just what I call top line notes. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for um, reminding us that TCA is not really a new concept. It builds on cost benefit analysis and let's learn from that and then fill in the gaps. Uh, what I heard throughout many of the presentations was the application of this, which could be one tool, not the only tool, but one tool for helping guide policies and programs um, almost by definition needs to be context specific. And what does that mean as far as the kind of information we need? Um, I thought the litmus test of how successful this is gonna be using TCA or uh, is what works uh, under what context and at what, at what cost. And Shabani, you had a, I'm gonna not capture this, uh, but shifting resources within a country and some of the low and middle income countries in which we work. Um, one of the challenges there is uh, some of the priorities we talked about today, like sustainable development goal um, two, zero hunger, competes with priorities across all other sustainable development goals. And how do we, how do we, um, put it in a, in a rightful place that's not overlooked, but yet at the same time an acknowledgement that there are many priorities at government level. And something you said, Kathleen, um, sparked a thought, and I can't do anything about it now, but what we really are talking about in a lot of the discussions today um, is almost a political economy analysis related to, to uh, politics, ideologies. Um, when you and I, happen to have the advantage of being political appointees in the Clinton administration. And I remember I'd often make the uh, comment to Secretary, then Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman, whatever our decision, whatever our decision I make, 
uh, someone's not happy. And Dan's response was, well, you're doing your job. Well, okay, fine. But I, I think we, you know, cut, to get things done, uh, we really need to think about not just the message, but how we are communicating that message. And let me give you an example. Uh, in ramp up to the uh, UN Food Systems Summit, I had some interactions with US delegations. And the phrase that I heard a lot uh, in some of these global discussions was our food systems are broken. And you'd see people you know, nodding their heads, food systems broken. Well, in this discussion, the point of view that maybe the value was, we don't think our food system in the United States is broken. It's a point of view. And they went on to discuss why um, overall expenditures on food are the lowest in the world. I don't know, that may be true. Uh, we've achieved enormous benefits. The uh, 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 dietary uh, uh, gap between low income and other uh, income groups has, has uh, narrowed. Anyway, they went on and on and on. But the point being, uh, a message of, um, in the U.S., food systems have achieved a lot, but we need to do more might have been more palatable. And I bring this up because um, it's, again, it's not simply um, evidence-based policies and programs, but how we, we reach thought leaders uh, in a way that motivates them maybe to think about certain changes in policies and programs. And Jamie, I think you said something like, we're all or mainly academics. Uh, that's probably true on this webinar, webinar, but that needs to change. We need to have, boy, have a broader group of people inv involved in this, uh, uh, these types of dialogue. And uh, closing note is we are continuing, we Tufts, to be involved in research and communications related to uh, true cost of county, true cost of food, true value of food. But we in, by no means think we can do it ourselves. And we are reaching out to a, a lot of other universities to think about what collaborations make sense, uh, building on comparative advantages of different universities, including Kathleen, obviously ASU. Uh, and, and so we kind of uh, leverage our expertise, but this, this has enormous potential for achieving successful transformation of food systems if we get it right. And let me just say it to be continued. Thank you again. I wish we had more time. Enjoy the rest of your day.